So this is an analysis on uh, UAP references throughout modern history and ancient history. Uh, it's an informal curation from myself of credible spoken and unspoken testimony regarding the phenomena throughout history. So we'll start with uh, introducing who I am. So I'm sure many of your, many or not all of your listeners probably don't know who I am. I'm an executive consultant professionally. I advise executives and boards and management teams on growth and strategy. I work in a number of sectors. I work in aerospace, quantum computing, microelectronics, AI, robotics. Um, but I, I also bridge out of those. Basically, I help new tech ventures that have uh, high rates of um, opportunity or, or score high on our viability analysis, meaning that the new venture either has a product or service that we deem will be valuable and uh, has a high chance of success. And so what we do is we take these ventures and we run them through an analysis that we've created. And that analysis will kind of tell us whether or not this venture or startup uh, has the right opportunity for investment, meaning is it uh, worthy of investment? Are there risks involved? Is it too risky? Is, is it you know, disruptive? Uh, so we measure a, a lot of different things. So I also am an investment liaison. I help um, startups in, in quantum computing and, and AI and, and various other markets and sectors uh, find funding and I pair them with uh, venture capital firms or angel investors to kind of get companies that we deem, we deem worthy of the, the social kind of output, meaning that the companies that we're interested in have opportunities that will help society in some regard. It's kind of a, uh, our mission. Um, we're not that interested in, in, in purely finding a company that can uh, rake in money but does nothing but act as a, as a parasite on society. We're looking for companies that uh, are developing products and services that will give back to society in some grand fashion. Usually that has to do with AI or computing or advancing some sort of uh, tech that already exists. I'm a trend analyst. I analyze trends. So when I'm not with my firm, I'm doing consulting for uh, boards and management teams and, and individual executives where we go over uh, tech trends and we look at metrics, and uh, past metrics and, and present ones. And we try to analyze where markets will be going, uh, what consumers are interested in, or what uh, business to business companies are doing. And so we, what I do is I help try to strategize and plan for these companies so that they can remain competitive in this age of automation that is upon us. I'm also a guest speaker. I do a lot of keynotes, uh, speeches, and tech talks regarding AI and the age of automation. And the age of automation is, you know, everything, the internet of things, um, automated services, uh, job reduction due to hyper automation, and these sort of things. You can just, uh, your, your followers could just Google me and I'm sure some of my talks will come up. And I also do podcasts like this. I've done one other podcast on the phenomenon. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I did it with my good friend and colleague, Deep Prasad. Uh, he's the CEO of Genmat, a quantum computing company. Um, I've been interested in the phenomena for a long time. I am not a UFO researcher. Uh, I look at it through a lens of uh, analysis of trends. So I have a unique perspective. I'm an expert in identi identifying trends. And, you know, it sounds 
a little obtuse to call yourself an expert, but from from what I've gathered, it's 10,000 hours, and I've certainly put 10,000 hours <laughs> into identifying trends. Um, I'm experienced in analyzing both soft and hard data sets. So that'll come up later in the presentation, soft and hard data sets. What is that? Soft data is generally ambiguous data or data that is difficult to define or prove to be valid 100%. Uh, hard data sets are 100% uh, verifiable. Usually they, they have a numerical value attached to them. Uh, and what I found uh, helps me be relevant in this field is that um, while working in the aerospace sector, I've had um, some very interesting encounters over the years uh, off the books with uh, individuals who uh, have worked in, in aerospace for some time and, and worked for some very uh, large aerospace corporations. And I think you and I had um, touched upon that in our previous conversation. And I also have exposure to cutting edge technology that, that it hasn't even seen the light of day. And having that perspective, I, I have a better idea as to what's possible, what's coming down the road uh, and what's impossible. And I also research history uh, from the perspective of human technological development. And what, that, what I mean by that is that um, I research history in order to identify past trends that have occurred. And when we do that, we have a better insight as to how to analyze the data that we're seeing presently. So I'll touch. So my goal here is to not present new information. I'm, I'm sure most of your viewers or followers have a breadth of knowledge about uh, the UAP phenomenon. Um, I do believe that I probably have some information here that'll be new to, to a lot of people, but I'm not trying to uh, break ground here. I, what I'm doing is trying to curate the data that I've collected in a, in a means that is um, understandable and will allow people interested in the phenomena kind of make sense of, of, of the whole thing in terms of um, ancient history through, throughout uh, human history to, to today. So what is a trend? Um, this was difficult to, to pin down to describe. Uh, it's my business, but it's, it's a difficult notion to put to paper. So trends are used as a form of measure when observing variables over a specific duration. They can be purely conceptual, uh, represent scientific analysis, or for the purpose of this presentation, be used to describe patterns in a civilization over time. Uh, trends are detectable expressions of collective human behavior and are derivatives of culture, economy, and innovation. Those are just kind of th three pillars, but there's many more uh, variables to consider when, when discussing trends. And they can either represent a change or a pattern over time. So a lot of what I do and a lot of what um, went into the viability analysis for my firm is that we study the past and nothing is really new in human behavior at scales, uh, meaning when you look at human behavior as a societal collective, we tend to repeat the same patterns over and over again, and this will become uh, relevant throughout, throughout the presentation. So when we were building models to conduct the analysis, we use metrics based on trends that have occurred throughout history. And anyone in my field or any good analyst will corroborate this practice if what they're seeking is a high resolution analysis of present day variables or are looking to forecast for future trends. 
So this is a, kind of an informal timeline that I use to break up this presentation. It, it doesn't uh, correlate with exact ages or uh, times. It's basically a tool that I'm using uh, to navigate this presentation. So here I have pre-Neolithic, which I determined to be 100,000 to 15,000 BC and the end of the Younger Dryas, uh, 15,000 BC to 8,000 BC. We'll start there. So everyone knows about Gobleki Tepe. Uh, it's the oldest verifiable megalithic site. Uh, it was aligned with celestial bodies and movements, contains primitive hieroglyphics, and displayed advanced stone cutting techniques. And here's some images of what they found there. It's really quite amazing when you consider that uh, it was dated to 13,000 BC. Uh, the Younger Dryas period, which was 13,000, uh, around 13,000 to 11,000 BC. So it kind of correlates with Gobleki Tepe, uh, massive climate event that affected the world's ocean levels, pre precipitation zones, and caused great flooding across the globe would have disrupted any civilizations that existed at the time, causing mass migrations and the loss of any developed coastal urban areas. References of great floods remain from cultural tales, always cited as happening before their respective times, I think is an interesting note. Uh, and what I'm doing right now is I'm kind of laying the foundation for what we're gonna talk about. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this as hundreds of people have done great in-depth uh, presentations on just these topics alone. So flood references from around the world. This was just a quick wiki uh, pick here. And as we see, there are, are dozens of flood myths. Uh, and this is what I would call a statistically significant, significant cultural trend. Uh, it's a trend because, well, look at all the unrelated um, cultures that that uh, are kind of talking about the same thing and it, it, they seem unrelated because they're divided by um, distance but there is clearly a relation there trends always have a point of origin even if we don't know what that origin is so on the surface it looks like they're all unrelated but there definitely has to be a point of origin um, so that, that's interesting to me. And many of these cultures are said to not have communication. The Rakat structure, uh, Jimmy uh, Cor Corsetti, I believe is his name, does an excellent analysis on the Rakat structure uh, in Mauritania, 9,000 BC or older. Its location, shape, dimension were referenced by Plato, who stated he learned of this famous city from writings of one of his ancient family members. Uh, the massive city was said to contain concentric rings of land and water that connected to the Southern Sea. So down here, you can kind of see some flood plains here. The, it was said to have been swept away during a great flood, uh, perhaps Younger Dryas. Uh, those who survived fled toward the Fertile Crescent, Kobleki Tepe, who knows. Geological evidence supports the hypothesis Extreme flooding clearly occurred. Such scales would have washed away any evidence under massive wall of powerfully moving salt water. So anything that wasn't uh, hundreds of tons uh, would, would have just been disintegrated and carried hundreds of miles uh, away. The Great Wall of China. Over the course of centuries, humans are very capable of constructing massive structures with just stone. So I'm using this to, to reference that um, something like the Rakat city uh, is, is definitely well within human abilities. Um, we have no idea if there was a city there. I, I suspect there probably was just based off historical accounts and, and the accuracy of those depictions. And so if there was a city there, how long did it take to build? Who knows, maybe hundreds of years, but it's certainly possible for a civilization to, to build something of that scale 
uh, over a great period of time. I mean, just just look at how incredible the Great Wall is even today. So an interesting note, the Rakat structure uh, has some CIA classified files on it. Um, I find that to be extremely interesting. Uh, what they were studying, why they were studying it, it is bizarre. But on, on these documents, you can see they were also studying several other um, sites. Uh, does it say, does it say what, the, uh, what the purpose of those studies were? were or? It was, I think I came across geomagnetic research, which, you know, that could be anything. Could that be could, anything, could yeah. Be, could be checking density of, of the um, stone underneath the, the topsoil uh, for purposes of mining, but I suspect it's more that they were looking for something. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting one off the coast of Japan, uh, Yonaguni Monument, um, ancient submerged megalithic site. Uh, there's still people who argue against its validity. Um, it's hard to argue when you see angles like this, but you know, just because the shapes seem irrelevant to modern architecture, that doesn't mean that the, the, they didn't have purpose. Um, I, I just find that really interesting. Uh, and, and if it is real, it alludes to a complex society that was above water and flourished at some point in history. The Bay of Cambay in India, 9,000 BC or older, another ancient submerged megalithic site, displays advanced stone cutting techniques, also alludes to a complex society and also was above water and flourished at some point. So we saw a trend there where, you know, uh, we see um, sunken and flooded sites that uh, kind of predate this narrative. Uh, and, and that's just something interesting to think about as we progress. So then we have kind of a rebirth starting at around 8,000 BC. Uh, and so we have ancient megalithic design trends, which I find interesting. So on, on the left side, we have pre-Inca and Inca sites, and then early Egyptian uh, sites. And they kind of follow a very similar pattern. And same thing with the right, uh, kind of the same sort of block stacking structure and technique used. And this is also from Jimmy's uh, site uh, video that he does analysis. So here we go, three points <clears throat> on Earth, all following nearly identical uh, structural patterns. Uh, it could be argued that this was the most feasible way to construct a pyramid, but then you get into the fact, uh, why are you constructing a four-sided pyramid? Why, why do they have to be six to seven tiers? Uh, why do they need to be aligned uh, astronomically to certain constellations? So what I see here is a pattern. Um, it's supposed to be unrelated, but like we discussed earlier, all trends and patterns have a point of origin, whether we know them or not. And again, just further pictures of trends in architectural design. It's actually quite stunning. When you, when you see how similar uh, these, these structures are. Uh, Pre-Inca and, and, and Egyptian, again, we have the tri-entry aesthetic. So three doorways all uh, embossed here. Interesting. And then we have the very unique way of, of structuring megalithic stone. Uh, this is Japan and Peru, allegedly completely unrelated, but yet their techniques are, are staggeringly uh, similar. And then we have also Inca and Egyptian, which you see here are these little dimples that we'll cover in a second. So here's some more trends in, in uh, aesthetic. So same, same sort of like keystone blocks here, here. 
here, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Italy. So, our, you know, it, it seems really implausible um, from an analyst perspective that this same design trend pops up time and time again um, without some sort of uh, point of origin or reference. Um, it, it's just highly unlikely. Yeah, the, mean it's uh, not true. Well, yeah, the, uh, the, the only thing I can think of, like from a skeptic's counterpoint would be, uh, you know, how multiple unconnected civilizations created something like the bow and arrow around the same time as each other. But would you say that this is something that is not as easy to compare in that kind of situation? I honestly believe that the bow and arrow was probably a traded technology from uh, indigenous people, ancient peoples, because they were very nomadic. If mm. there's anything to be said about our prehistory um, relatives, it's that they traveled. And boy, did they travel. I mean, they think about it. They walked on foot thousands of miles and, and ran into other communities of people. So I don't think that uh, this, this notion that bows and arrows immediately popped up in, in all these cultures completely unrelated is, is true. I think that information was probably passed on through, you know, the game of telephone where you, you have one group yeah. tells another, yeah. they run into another. You can cross the whole globe rather, rather quickly with, with that principle. So that would be my argument to a skeptic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here we have more of the stone aesthetic uh, again it's it's uh it's hard to argue that something is is uh something like this was accidental and here we have the dimple designs which we find in japan india sudan peru turkey ethiopia bulgaria micronesia china egypt syria and indonesia so no one really knows what uh the purpose of these four uh, dimples are for, and, and as an analyst, that furthers my belief in that there's a hidden component somewhere in our prehistory that's some reason these are significant, whether it's some sort of um, manufacturing technique, um, it, perhaps to lift the, the blocks, or perhaps it's a uh, it's a numerical system to designate a certain time frame, or who knows? I mean, we really don't know. Um, if it is a manufacturing technique, then th that's pretty clear that there was a point of origin because something that obscure doesn't just pop up. Uh, like you said, you could argue a bow and arrow because that's out of necessity. Uh, something like this specific technological technique um, points to a, a trend, a manufacturing trend of stone blocks or, or masonry in general. And then we have trapezoidal entries, uh, all within an eight degree margin. And I got the eight degree margin, not as a reference uh, from somewhere online. It was from uh, measuring and looking at a lot of trapezoidal entries. And, and I was, <laughs> I don't ever want to look at another one, but I discovered that uh, they're all very, very close to the same angle. Uh, there's, there's, it's difficult because I'm looking at, you know, really low res pictures that are often skewed or their per perception is at an angle, but uh, that's a, it points to a very interesting design trend. Uh, here's a trend in sarcophagus design, which, Again, I find this hard to argue against a, a unifying point of origin when you look at how similar these, these castings, these tops of the sarcophagus are. So you have your, your giant dimples here on the sides, probably to help lift it, but I'm mm. not sure. Uh, if that's the case, um, you still have the angular uh, kind of design features. Yeah, they, they both almost kind of look like a cartoon Christmas tree. They both have that same exact yeah. Uh, design. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, 
again, that's it's not born out of necessity. This isn't a tool of survivability. This is something that uh, individual cultures would design aesthetically per their own unique style. Um, but clearly, uh, they're copying or mimicking something that uh, predated themselves or are connected in some fashion. Oops, how do I go back? Well, we have uh, here, we have the, you know, handbag trend that we see. I, I was going to see if you brought this up. I, will, I didn't want to jump the gun and ask about it, but I'm glad you brought this up. Please continue. Yeah, uh, the earliest, uh, prior to Gobleki Tepe, uh, it was the Sumerians had depicted this bag. And, and I've scoured looking for Inca, Inca and Aztec um bags but i hadn't uh, i hadn't seen any until i found this one and again this is not a coincidence i mean the shape the way they're holding it out stretched in front of themselves um something has to do with this bag and there's a there's a common derivative uh in these cultures with this bag I'm sure there's a mythos associated with each culture and what the bag signifies, but I'm looking at it as a purely design aesthetic and trend, and, and there's a clear, clear connection here. And again, we have another aesthetic trend, another artistic trend. Uh, we see on Easter Island, Bolivia, Turkey, Indonesia, and there are others, and mine the Mind the uh, Neolithic erection from Indonesia, the very graphic, but uh, you see the hands depicted fashion that's similar in each of these <clears throat> that uh, seems odd. Uh, that's all I can say. It, it, it may be a coincidence. I, I don't see uh, as strong a connection as you do for like the sarcophagus lid or the way the dimples on, on the architecture. But it is a unique feature that um, definitely points to a connection when you consider all the other things we just looked at. Here we have the, the tridents. So I believe this is ancient Sumerian, ancient Indian, uh, and Greek all with tridents. Now, you know, tridents were originally used for fishing. Um, again, I don't believe that they were, you know, kind of popped up uh, individually over time. It's probably one of those uh, technology torches that were passed from community to community tens and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, perhaps, maybe made out of bamboo originally. Um, but it's interesting that it is uh, depicted as uh, an object of power. Um, so again, we have another uh, thread of a trend here. And so those uh, were from Jimmy Corsetti's. And I'll be giving Jay the link to this presentation for the viewers. And I numbered all the slides here so people can reference each thing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show. I wanted to make it pretty easy for people to look up the information either to, to vet it or if it was something of interest. Uh, I know from my experience uh, watching presentations, I'll, I'll hear or see something that uh, I wanna look back and it's a nightmare trying to find. Yeah, and for, for everyone so, listening, I will put a link in the description box below for Jimmy's uh, YouTube channel because, uh, and I'll, I'll probably find the Atlantis videos that he did about the Ricard structure because they're, they're worth watching. They're very good. And he actually recently was on the Joe Rogan experience, yeah. which I would highly recommend yeah. people watch. Uh, very glad. Yeah, that was, that was that. a surprise. Yeah, well, we were literally talking about the guy and then I found out like, <laughs> you know, that he was on Joe Rogan. I was like, well, that's great. Um, so yeah, just, just so that people know, there'll be links in the description box if you want to check out Jimmy's channel. So here we're expanding on my timeline a little bit. Um, we're gonna be moving into some more detailed stuff now. So we have pre-modern UAP references. This is gonna be interesting for your viewers, I think. So we're gonna cover chronologically 
um, from 1000 BC to 700 AD, the most uh, credible accounts of um, UAP exposure. Uh, I've heavily curated this list. There were hundreds and hundreds of references that uh, I didn't deem worthy of including. So the, what I included here was all, um, all is referenced um, in previous literature, whether modern or ancient. Um, I wanted the data set to be as clean as possible. You know, that's kind of what I do. A clean, clean data uh, represents a high resolution outcome. So our analysis will be all the better given that we were very selective of what uh, I'll be showing here. So we have Pharaoh Akhenaten, 1347 BC. Uh, he had a unique experience that was to shape Egyptian history. According to inscriptions on the frontier stele, how do you pronounce that? Stella? Found on the circumference of El uh, Amarna, Akhenaten was strolling along the river, admiring the splendors of nature one summer morning when he looked up and saw a shining disc descend from the sky. And this really begins the presentation. So 218 BC, uh, Italy, during the winter, many, many people uh, or many instances occurred in Rome and the surrounding area. A phantom navy was seen shining in the sky in the territory of Amiternum beings in human shape and clothed in white were seen at a distance, but no one came close to them. So this was really the first account of seeing multiple UAP aside from the Pharaoh's uh, celestial disc he saw. And I kind of pulled this from Google Earth to show you where this is located. And kind of, it's kind of close to the ocean, but in a, a very heavily mountained and valleyed area. So a lot, lots of places to, of interest and to hide and, and to observe. Titus Livius, Livius, 64 BC. Livy discovers several accounts that stated in the winter of 2018, Roman infantry had witnessed phantom ships had been seen gleaming in the sky. Uh, he clearly believes this information to be of high regard and records his discovery in a surviving work titled The History of Rome. So Livy was a historian for Rome. You, even back then, they had historians, which kind of tells you how, how far back uh, human culture goes. But when he was referencing for his, his book, he came upon what we just read in the previous slide, um, that uh, servicemen had, had witnessed these uh, shining, gleaming, uh, they called them ships uh, in the sky. Italy, 216 BC, during uh, the famous battle won by Hannibal uh, in the Ap Apollonian plain near Bar Barletta, which saw the largest defeat in the history of Rome, a mysterious phenomenon was observed. On the day of the battle in the sky of Apulia, round objects in the shape of ships were seen. Uh, the prodigies carried on all night long, meaning the instances, the occurrence carried on all night long. On the, on the edge of such objects were seen men dressed in white, like clergymen around a plow. Hmm. And that's another interesting reference that we don't hear about today. Well, that's, the, that's the second uh, reference to people dressed in white. I never, yeah. I never knew that until I started conducting this analysis. This is interesting. I, I, I haven't heard of any of these so far, so uh, you're, you're educating me. Again, in Italy, 103 BC, during the war with the Cimbri from Emilia and Todi, cities of Italy, it was reported that at night there had been seen in the heavens flaming spears and shields, which at first moved in different directions and then clashed together, assuming the formations and movements of men in battle. And finally, some of them would give way while others pressed on in pursuit and all streamed away to the west world, westward. And this was you know, uh, documented 
uh, through Harvard University's um, library, uh, Plutarch. Hard to uh, hard to say those are Russian or Chinese drones. Yeah, we're going to see an interesting <laughs> pattern here. Italy in 99 BC and Tarquinia over a wide area, a bright object was seen, which flew away click quickly at sunset around shield flew west to the east. And I, I did some research and I found the shields that were available at that time in Italy. Uh, I believe what they're describing is a Parma shield which looks surprisingly like uh, how we would depict a modern flying saucer. And this is also documented in historical narratives. And I'm gonna butcher all of these names. I'm not a historian, so I apologize. Um, I'll do my best. Gaius Plinius, 24 AD. Secundus was an early Roman naval and army commander. Later, he became an author who wrote Naturalist Historia, basically natural history. This book later became the framework most encyclopedias are still built upon. So this guy literally wrote the first encyclopedia. I find that fascinating. According to him, in 76 BC, a spark, a glowing orb, fell from the sky and grew as it descended until it appeared to be the size of the moon. It then ascended back up to the heavens and was transformed into a light. So this guy is clearly an analytical fellow. Anyone who is writing a book on natural history uh, is probably only interested in, in, in provable dialogue or stuff that actually happened. China, 34 AD, a white round object accompanied by 10 small stars flies overhead. And this was documented in some Chinese pendant uh, and reference in 1846. We'll see more about these small stars and round objects. Lucius Plutarchus, 56 AD, 119 AD. Plutarch was the uncle of Sextus, who was one of the teachers of Marcus Aurelius and who may have been the same person as the philosopher Sextus uh, and, and Percuus. Plutarch studied mathematics and philosophy in a Athens under Ammonius from 66 to 67. According to Plutarch, a Roman army commander by Lucius Lucullus was about to begin a battle uh, of Pontus when all of a sudden the sky burst asunder and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar and in color like molten silver. Plutarch reports the shape of the object as like a wine jar. The apparently silvery object was reported by both armies. And I found a, a wine jar of that time period. So that's kind of an interesting shape. And then runes at the Apollo uh, at Delphi, where Plutarch served as one of the priests responsible for interpreting the predictions of the Plythia. So he had an interesting life. Scotland, uh, Caledon Wood, Scotland, 80 AD. When the Roman emperor was in Scotland, wondrous flames were seen in the skies over Caledon Wood, all one winter night. Everywhere the air burned, and on many nights, when the weather was serene, a ship was seen in the air moving fast. China, 253 AD. The army of Emperor Hu Chu and Chu himself witnessed a glowing red sphere that flew over them three times. And this was depicted in several uh, ancient Chinese accounts. Again, China, 314 AD, the sun came down to the ground and three other suns rose together over the western horizon and flew together toward the east. So I think when they're referencing the sun, they, they lack the um, vocabulary to describe uh, a glowing orb. Yeah, I was about to say uh, probably like that, a, that's, an orb. That's my estimation. Yeah. Obviously, it's not the sun. <laughs> yeah. 
British Isles, 497 AD. Um, during these transactions at Winchester, there appeared a star of wonderful magnitude and brightness darting forth and a ray at the end of which was a globe of fire in the form of a dragon, um, out of whose mouth issued forth two rays, one of which 51 seemed to stretch out itself beyond the extent of Gaul, the others toward the Irish Sea and ended in seven lesser rays. Now, I, I question the amount, the, the numbers, but what I find interesting was the reference of globe and fire. Fire, I believe, is how the ancients were depicting uh, glowing light or yeah, yeah. Um, unnatural light. Uh, so here we have a glowing orb um, shooting uh, light beams down and darting to and fro. What about the form of the form of a dragon? I mean, I suppose if they're attributing the flames, then, but it's the same yeah. form of a dragon, which is interesting. It's hard because I don't know what the original translation was. And well, who yeah, translated yeah. It, uh, it in the form of a dragon. I don't know what kind of cultural reference. Yeah. Basically, I, I I found this interesting because of the glowing orb and and the shooting of the 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 light beam, which uh, is a trend that we'll we'll observe throughout this presentation. And again, the references here for your viewers. Rome, Italy, 540 AD. Often a little spark has seemed to come down from the sky to the earth. Then having grown into a kind of orb like the moon, it had been seen as disc-like. So there's a spark, a, a, a bright dot coming down. And as it gets closer, uh, it's, a, it's a flying saucer that was glowing. I don't know how how else you could uh, describe that. Uh, Nara pre Prefecture, Japan, 596 AD, an object like a canopy or lotus flower descends and appears suspended above the temple. It changes color and shape. So here we're have, we see a lot of cultural references in the way they describe things. And we do this today, a flying saucer. You know, uh, a thousand years from now, people are going to go, what the hell's a saucer? Um, it's, a, it's a bowl. It's a plate that you put tea on. So when they describe it as, as a lotus, I think what they're describing is a circular object, probably with um, some sort of weird apparitions around the rim with a, with a rounded dome at the top. Uh, that's how I, I look at it, changing yeah. color. Well, there are, some, there are some reports, uh, and some of them are historical, and even a couple of paintings, actually, that have sources that um, have these grooves in them that almost make it seem like a flower petal. And uh, the, the kind of petals of the flower are these, uh, these grooves within the saucer shape. So it could be something along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. Seem to have lost Sorry. your camera, Mikai. No, I took a I took a drink. Oh, okay, no worries, man. Ireland, uh, nine five ninety seven A.D. We saw the whole vault of heaven become suddenly illuminated. Struck by the suddenness of the miracle, we raised our eyes and looked toward the east. When I, I don't know what uh, term that is, lo and behold, perhaps. There appeared something like an immense pillar of fire, which again, I believe is how they describe unnatural light, which seemed to us as it, as it ascended upwards at the midnight to illuminate the whole earth like the summer sun at noon. And after that column penetrated the heavens, darkness followed as if the sun had just set. That's interesting. I mean, I mean, even even in the cultural perspective of of attribu attributing it to fire, they're saying it lit up the entire landscape. So that's a uh, you know, they're obviously incredibly bright, whatever it Extremely was. Extremely bright flashlight. Yeah. Kent, England, six sixty four A.D. In the dead of night, there appeared from God a glittering pillar of light shining over the hall of the king's palace, which by it, it's unwanted illumination aroused many of the king's household 
And they, in their great astonishment, uttering loud cries, the king was awakened and ignorant to what had occurred, arose from his bed and set out to go to the hymns and maidens while it was yet night. On leaving the house, he saw a globe of extraordinary splendor burning with a white flame, the origin of which proceeded from the af aforesaid wonderful seed of light. Again, that's a very, very wordy description of, hey, I saw a freaking glowing sphere. <laughs> yes, yeah, the old, old English version of saying I saw a UFO. Yeah, old, old English poetic version. But again, we're seeing the trend of a sphere that is glowing unnaturally, yeah. um, sometimes shooting light beams. And what's interesting is that these spheres tend to, tend to go to places of interest where there are seats of power or uh, people who study the sky. And it could just be that these people, at the, the places of power had more people to record the history or astronomers or people of um, knowledge uh, were more apt to be able to write them down. So there probably are hundreds of thousands of more references yeah. that well, just that, well, were never done. I mean, it, you know, these things could be flying by peasant villages and, you you know, you just don't know because there's no historian writing the records. So uh, obviously Correct. the ones we're going to hear are going to come from the areas where they had historical record. Correct. And this is the, these are excluding all of the accounts that I I, I believe probably were were true but i couldn't get credible sources yeah. so i i uh, didn't include them ireland 698 a.d three shields were seen in the heavens as it as it were warring from the east to the west after the manner of undulating waves on a very calm night being that of the ascension of the lord the first was snowy the second was fiery the third was bloody so what I believe is being described here is three saucers glowing at different frequencies, you know, uh, could be the, the way they were traveling, the Doppler effect or uh, the ionization of the air, um, just creating different colors. And we've yeah. seen this many, many so times. So it could, it could be a, a white, an orange and a red UFO in, in essence. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and that, that part where it said undulating, that's an interesting description mm -hmm. for levitating. We often, uh, you know, you put a uh, magnet over a frozen, like uh, another magnet, and you can superposition it, and you see like this kind of wobble as though it's on water. It's an interesting effect that I think they were trying to depict there. So France, 760 AD, during the reign of Pepin, Le Bref, it's quite a name, many extraordinary phenomena are said to have appeared in the French skies. The air was filled with human figures, ships with sails, and battling armies. Several individuals stated that they had been abducted by aerial beings. Uh, you know, I question some of this, but again, what we're looking at is the trend of phenomena in the sky uh interacting whether directly or indirectly with um individuals below and it's interesting to see again we see this uh filled with human figures yeah uh you don't hear much of that in modern literature although there are some accounts um ships with sails and battling armies it's it's hard to pick out but i was more interested in in the reference of phenomenon in the skies well do you think do you think that there's there's an aspect of this that is a like a psychological imprint and a culturally defined imprint so you know because we have a, a society that has technologies platforms that are in the in the skies we can understand this issue within the lens of aliens in spacecraft but they're seeing battles in the sky with figures and ships with sails and it, it makes me wonder is this the same phenomenon that is just being represented in a different way because of the cultural representation like are, are humans themselves placing through maybe some sort of you know interface within the brain an imprint of a culturally acceptable 
uh, kind of pattern onto this, or is this phenomenon actually presenting itself in this form? I mean, that's that's there, something that really baffles me. Yeah, there's two arguments to that. I I ascribe to uh, more on the human brain's ability to interpret yeah. um, staggering information or information that uh, is so mind blowing it's you have to create new like neural pathways to understand yeah. it so and it in order to mechanism. do so you, yes correct it's a it's actually a documented it's it's very similar to the rorschach or seeing a shadow in the woods uh and an outline and and you, yeah. you think it's a different shape um because you need to make sense of what you just saw and I think the more people communicated these experiences with each other, the more they kind of calmed each other down by making it more worldly, mm. adding details that that weren't so obscure uh, that it just the, the mind couldn't handle it. That's that's my analysis. Yeah. I don't know if they could be projecting holographic information or or affecting individuals uh thoughts uh, but i i just uh i don't think that's necessary i don't mm. think uh i don't think that's something that uh based on this what i've researched here it doesn't seem like they care enough it seems mostly like they're indifferent or inquisitive but not to the point of um not to the point of like purposefully making uh fake images i'm not i'm yeah. not saying that doesn't happen or hasn't happened i'm just saying in my uh analysis i i, I don't see that uh as being probable yeah cyberg germany 776 a.d saw the likeness of two shields red with flame wheeling over the church when the heathens outside saw this miracle, they were at once thrown into confusion and started fleeing to their camp in terror. So again, uh, something that is so astonishing that your mind can't comprehend will cause a uh, flight or fl uh, flight response. Um, and if it's something like that, I, I'm sure many of us would run. Uh, I certainly would. I wouldn't know what to make of it. But I found a historic recreation of what a um, shield looked like during the uh, 8th century AD. So again, this looks very similar to what a UFO uh, UAP today. Charlemagne, Germany, 811 AD. One day in his last campaign into Saxony uh, against Godfred, king of the Danes, Charles himself saw a ball of fire fall suddenly from the heavens with a great light, just as he was leaving camp before sunrise to set out on the march. It rushed across the clear sky from right to left, and everybody was wondering what was the meaning of the sign. So again, we have another occurrence where these are seen at a battle or areas of contention or shown to people of providence. And then obviously we can even relate this back to more modern uh, historical occurrences like the Foo Fighters and the orbs that were yeah. experienced well, by uh, yeah. Allied yeah. and Axis uh, uh, pilots. Yeah. Don't get ahead of yourself, Jerry. I know, I'm you, sorry. You sorry. Something I'm, for me. I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> jumping the gun. China, 814 AD, a luminous object rises, lights up the ground, uh, many small stars emerge from it. Interesting. China, 840 AD, early that night we saw a sacred lamp on top of the ridge on the other side of the valley east of the terrace. Our whole group saw it and admired it. The light was about the size of a begging bowl at first but it expanded to the size of a small house. Deeply moved, the crowd sang with full voice the name of his holiness. Then another lamp appeared near the valley. That one too only was the size of a rain straw hat at first and then grew gradually. The two lights when seen from afar seemed about a hundred steps apart. They were shining ardently. At midnight, they died becoming invisible. That's a very well articulated account there uh for for something that you know 
skeptics would argue is is fake. Uh, that is highly detailed in, in China a long time ago. And again, we see these things coming to observe uh, groups of people uh, coalescing, doing whatever, whether it's a religious ceremony or a war. Those are pretty much the only times groups of people got together in prehistory or ancient history uh, was for religious ceremony and war, unless they lived in a city. <clears throat> But I took, I went and did some research and found an 8th century Chinese bowl. You flip that upside down, you can tell what it looks like. Same with the straw hat. China, 900 AD. A fat star as large as 500 meters square, yellow in color, flew towards the southwest. It had a pointed head and the rear was cylindrical. It moved like a snake accompanied by numerous small stars that appeared suddenly. It sounds a lot like the Tic Tac incident. You have a cylindrical shaped object with a number of smaller glowing objects mm -hmm. uh, buzzing about it. Uh, I find that fascinating. Hungary, 919 AD, people saw a bright spherical object shining like stars along with a bright torch moving to and fro in the sky. More glowing orbs. Japan, 967 AD, numerous objects in triangular formation flying under the rain clouds, trajectory east to west, east, east, west. So here we have another account of them flying in a formation. Uh, makes me think of the video you just posted on your Twitter account of the uh, orbs in formation. Yeah, Mick, Mick West has already commented saying it's military flares, but, you know, can't, <laughs> can't, can't expect anything less from Mick West. <laughs> well, I have my opinions on, on Mick West. Oh, we will Istanbul, do. Turkey, 989 AD. The star appeared in the west after sunset. It rose in the evening and had no fixed place in the sky. It spread bright rays visible from a great distance and kept moving, appearing further north or further south. And once when it rose, changed its place in the sky, making sudden and fast movements. Well, that's interesting. Another, uh, another bright orb spreading rays of light. Uh, moving erratically around, and that was Turkey, Istanbul. So trends we've observed so far, uh, we've seen objects glowing spheres, white, yellow, and red, shields, discs, and bowls, um, which I believe all are representative of the same object, uh, beams of light, the movements, uh, tend to be against gravity, uh, hovering or slow and fast and erratic. Other significant patterns of reference uh, happen during major conflicts in areas where celestial bodies were studied, clustered populations. And then there's the flames or fire. Uh, I think maybe that's referring to either plasma or some sort of light, some sort of artificial light. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting actually because setting aside the cultural interpretations of shields or uh, you know ships in the sky if you just kind of break it down to what we what we know about uh, UAP there doesn't really seem to be that much of a difference between what was seen then and what was seen now it's more of the cultural interpretations of the time because really what we seem to be looking at is orbs uh, saucer yep. style craft and maybe even like you said with the uh, with the elongated like kind of tubular ones like a tic tac so um, there are, yeah, there are four shapes that um, I have found to be uh, concurrent throughout history mm. that are referenced and even up until today. So, you know, you can make whatever um, sort of interpretation of that as you will. Uh, from my knowledge of um, <clears throat> electrogravitic propulsion uh, in theory, uh, the shape shape matters very little, if at all. Uh, once the field is around the the mass of the object, uh, 
uh, all shape uh, is just irrelevant. So can I can I ask you then just real quickly, um, what why do you think there is a difference in shape? If it is because uh, you you obviously I, I I I agree with you. I mean, if you can bubble off a bit of space and time and move around in that type of format, then obviously you don't really need to rely on aerodynamics or uh, you know like specific flight characteristics. So just yep. wondering before we move into anything else, why do you think that there is uh, a difference in in shapes and and sizes? Well, um, I was uh, I was going to talk about that at the end, but I think we can talk about that now. Uh, I believe that there are, are actually four or more factions um, with similar technology interacting uh, with each other at times. Uh, we've seen multiple accounts of them engaging each other, and then we have multiple accounts of, of different shapes. And so you, you kind of look at it like today. We have different countries that build cars. The cars operate under the same principle. They have engines and wheels, but the aesthetic, the design, the manufacturing is, is what differentiates um, the vehicles. So in my interpretation, if you're an advanced uh, civilization, you may be engineering these craft in a different manner using different material, but ultimately the propulsion system is, is the same, but the material and manufacturing may be different. And material and manufacturing is what designates uh, your design aesthetic, or sometimes it's cultural. I mean, who knows? It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to gauge, but I see, I've seen four uh, fundamental shapes. And there are hundreds described throughout <clears throat> the UAP kind of phenomenon, but they neatly fit into four categories. So failing China, uh, 1059 in July, the pearl was round with a gold colored ring around it. Suddenly it enlarged 75 considerably and became bigger than a table. In its center, the luminary was white and silvery, and the intensity was such that it could not be looked at straight on. The light it emitted even reached trees that were some five kilometers away. And as a result, these cast their shadows on the ground. The faraway sky was all alight. Finally, the round luminous object began to move at breathtaking speed and landed on the water between the waves like a rising sun. So this is an inter interesting interaction with a glowing sphere. Uh, we see spheres that seem to grow and shrink often. Uh, they're, they're typically the ones that illuminate these really, really bright lights. Uh, for what purpose? So I don't think we'll ever know, but it's an interesting trend in, in these references. London, England, June 1193. <clears throat> On the 7th of the Ides of June at six o'clock, a thick black cloud rose in the air, the sun shining clear all around. In the middle of the cloud was an opening out of which 84 preceded a bright whiteness which hung in a ball under the black cloud over the side of Thames. Hmm. So we have another sphere, uh, this time interacting with the weather, whether by accident or intentional, or it could just be a byproduct of, of the, the way they maneuver. It's impossible to tell. But uh, another encounter with a, with a strange moving orb. And do, do, do do you know what the relevance of the 84 is? No, I don't. I, uh, I don't know what that means. It could have been referencing something else in the account, or it could be referencing how many. Or it could be a mistake in a translation. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. Okay. That's a good question, though. 1200 AD, Yorkshire, England. <clears throat> in the third year of John, King of England, there were seen in Yorkshire five moons, one in the east, the second in the west, the third in the north, the fourth in the south, and the fifth, as it were, set amidst 
of the other. So five uh, in even distribution. M having many blazing stars about it. So little glowing spheres going about it and went five or six times encompassing the other as if it were the space of one hour and shortly after vanished away. So we have these large spheres that came down with a lot of other small spheres hovering around them. Um, for what purpose? Who, who knows? Uh, but I think when they're describing moons, it's probably a whitish color instead of like a yellow sun. I think that's how uh, we'll see different depictions of seeing moon and suns. And I, I attribute that to the, the light spectra of the orb. England, 1253 AD. Nicholas of Findern reported to Burton Abbey that above the hour of Vespers, the sky being clear, suddenly a large bright star appeared out of a black cloud with two smaller stars in the vicinity. A battle royale soon commenced, the small stars charging the great star again and again so that it began to diminish, diminish in size and sparks of fire fell from the combatants. This continued for a considerable time, and at last the spectators, stupefied by fear and wonder and ignorant of what, what might have uh, happened, they, they fled. So that's interesting. That's the second account in England of a large uh, sphere and little spheres around it. Um, it sounds like, from what they're describing, <clears throat> that the little spheres weren't in relation uh, to the large sphere, that it, it appeared to them to be attacking. I don't know how you could interpret what uh, uh, balls of light are attacking or not, but that's clearly how they identified it. Nonetheless, it's a very strange accounted phenomenon. Lu Ying, China, June 1277. Now I see three luminous objects appear in the southern sky of which two fly away and disappear suddenly from my sight. The one which remains possesses five unequaled lights beneath it and above its upper part, I see something in the form of a dome. The unknown object begins to move in a zigzag like a dead leaf. So you have this kind of movement. At the same time, some fiery things fall from the sky a short time afterwards, the sun rises, but its brightness is dulled by the luminous object that moves quickly in a northerly direction. In the western sky, a green cloud is suddenly disturbed by another unknown object, oval in the sky, flat, that descends quickly. This object is more than three meters long and is surrounded by flames. It rises again shortly after its descent. I think here we have a depiction of uh, phenomena interacting with itself. Um, again, this is a pretty detailed description to be either made up or for, you know, who knows, for just no reason whatsoever. But a lot of information can be gleaned from this. Uh, we have more glowing orbs zigzagging around. Um, something's happening where things are falling to the to the earth uh, the objects are so bright that they're brighter than the rising sun so their their light is still like casting shadows um, and then this other unknown object oval in shape and flat this is the only known description of a craft of that uh, nature i've ever come across I don't know if what they're describing is a circular disc and it appears oval if it's at an angle. So if you have a round circular shape and you tilt it, it looks like an oval at a distance if you can't perceive depth. So that, that could be what's being described. Who knows? It's an interpretation. It's still a significant, um, significant variable to consider in, in the analysis. Florence, Italy, June 1347, uh, writer 
Gian Franco Delgi Espoti mentions that reports relating to the period of the famous Black Plague between 1347 and, the, and 1350 speak of strange cigar shaped objects. Uh, I don't believe that it was originally called a cigar. I think the translator translated that shape into a cigar shaped object, uh, slowly crossing the sky, sometimes at low altitude dispersing in their passage a disturbing mist. So here we have uh, a tic-tac-like craft um, moving across the sky slowly, uh, kind of making a mist, which uh, this famous writer believes uh, correlated with the Black Plague somehow. That's interesting. Could be they were studying it. It could be a number of things could be non-related. Uh, Netherlands, June 1513. According to uh, some chronicler, Benedetto's Luciano's book, Volnera Diligentis, Michelangelo saw a triangular sign one calm night. It resembled a star with three tails, one silvery, the second one red, and the third fiery and by Bifurcated. So I don't think what he sees is a triangular craft, which would be your first interpretation. I think what he's seeing is three uh, glowing spheres of different color in a triangular pattern. The fact That's that my interpretation. The, the fact that he says the third fiery and bifurcated, I don't know if the uh, terminology was different then, but I would suggest that the, the fiery one actually split into two or uh, in some way. Yeah, or, or wasn't, um, or was blurry somehow. Yeah. Maybe that's how they describe blurry. Yeah. But here again, we have white, red, and yellow. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Michelangelo, Italy, cruel and strange observation of a yellow object in the sky flying over during the siege of the city. The inhabitants of Utrecht panicked while attackers took it as a sign of impeding success. It was written at the time the city of Utrecht was heavily besieged. A terrible sign was seen in the sky which threw the town inhabitants into dismay and the enemies into the hope of capturing the town again we have an object appearing during a time of battle um, seems to be observing what's going on a yellow object italy 1546 chronicle her father antonio uh, Cassena tells of farmers reporting a strange disc changing from yellow to red with red fireballs shining beneath it. We've seen and heard of that before. It was seen in two separate areas, including the small village of uh, Carnaza near Paso del Baco from time to time. This was in 1546. Germany, March 1551, Emperor Charles Quint decides to halt the siege after viewing three large glowing spheres, three <laughs> suns moving around the sky during the battle for the city. Again, this trend seems to be... Orange, orange orbs. Which, also uh, three. Yeah, three, yeah, which... Is, uh, is a phenomenon that I have witnessed personally uh, myself. And you know, I find this very interesting that that's hmm. such a pattern, orange orbs. Interesting. It was also during a battle. <laughs> Mine wasn't. <laughs> that you know of. That, that I know of, Nost yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nostradamus, France, 1551. While viewing the, and, and, you know, take what you want from Nost Nostradamus and his uh, metaphysical predictions. This guy was an astronomer. He studied the night sky like probably no one else at his time. So he, he was a keen observer. While viewing the night sky as usual, Nostradamus and everyone else in town witnessed a bright burning rod change its flight path and was in the sky for two hours displaying a swinging motion. Hmm. I, I would attribute this shape as a, as a cigar shape. Yeah. Um, 
they didn't have cigars back then, but it's cylindrical, uh, long, elongated, and it was zigzagging back and forth or, or going back and forth. Nuremberg. I was, hope, I was hoping Empire. you'd bring this one up. 1561. Residents of Nuremberg saw what they described as an aerial battle, followed by the appearance of a large black triangular object and then a large crash outside of the city. The broadsheet claims that witnesses observed hundreds of spheres, cylinders, and other odd-shaped objects that moved erratically overhead. Interesting. There's a lot of documentation on this one. Yeah. I had to include it. This is the first in my you know, investigation. This is the first ever reference of a black triangle. And it correlates with a battle. So we can interpret something casually here, obviously uh, nothing in stone, but you know, we could interpret that perhaps this new player uh, is in town and uh, somebody doesn't like it. And it happened to have been witnessed by this town. That's my interpretation. Could Do you be think, anything. You think this might be uh, the first historical accounting of a, of a black triangle? Yeah. I, it, I, it is based on my research mm. and I combed a lot. Uh, I, I found nothing else that doesn't mean it doesn't exist it means that i didn't find it mm. uh we see triangular patterns of uh orbs but never a black triangle and this they very clearly state uh, you can't mistake a black triangle in a night in a day sky so that, that's no. interesting Switzerland, August 1566. A broadsheet published in 1566 depicted numerous spherical objects appearing out of the sun. So I, I take that to mean out of the, the daytime sky. This event is depicted in a 16th century uh, woodcut by Samuel Cocius and Samuel Aparius. Uh, at the dawn of August 7th, we saw a large black spheres coming and going with great speed and precipitation before the sun and chattered as if they led a fight. Many of them were fiery red and soon crumbled and then extinguished. Huh. So now we're seeing an introduction of black spheres. We, yeah. we, we saw that a few slides ago. Um, which never were reported in ancient history. At least we don't have any accounts of. Yeah, you know, you know, so so many times people kind of brush aside historical uh, testimonies and accounts like this because, oh well, you know, they they just didn't have a, a very advanced understanding of atmospheric phenomena and things like that. And Correct. It, you, think, you just yep. think, well, some of these some of these instances wouldn't be able to be accurately described now. I just I I think it's a, no. a throwaway statement. <clears throat> Uh, you and, know, kind of say they were dumb. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with this presentation is yeah. when you look at each one of these individually, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, well, that's interesting, but it's probably they, mm -hmm. they just are, you know, being very creative with some natural occurrence. But when you look at them as a whole and you start to connect them um, through the uh, lens of a trend, yeah, you yeah. start to see patterns that uh, are, are almost impossible to discredit um, as a whole. Uh, I highly doubt people from small villages were talking to each other across the world about uh, the UAP phenomenon back then. <laughs> uh, and if they were, where did that derive? It could only have derived from actual occurrences. So uh, again, uh, this time in Korea, uh, 1609, on September 22nd in 1609, multiple witnesses reported seeing uh, sky objects in Wanju, Gang, Gangren, something county. It looks like a halo or bowl and is divided into two. So I, I found a Korean cooking bowl or pot from that time. And look, just all you have to do is look at the lid. 
same sort of disc very shape. sorcery yeah yep uh prague czechoslovakia 1619 <clears throat> this is an interesting one the inhabitants of the village were on guard as the country is full of soldiers because of the partialities and differences that exist in the empire today war basically the village priest was with them at about 10 in the evening he was praying looking up at the sky when suddenly he stopped astounded by what he saw he could see a globe that resembled the moon but fiery. It divided into two parts, and one of the parts divided into four smaller globes. The most amazing thing was that one of the globes disappeared, and in its place we saw a bloody crucifix. These things stayed in the sky for a short time and then disappeared gradually, finally vanishing into a big hole. Then we just saw a great globe which resembled the moon as we had witnessed at the beginning this whole process repeated three to four times and then everything disappeared wow okay so i didn't want to talk about it previously when when the accounts of the black spheres uh i actually don't think those were objects i believe the spheres represent um represent a hole in space time and that's yeah. how we would observe them <clears throat> so if you were to punch a hole in three-dimensional space time it would look like a flat black disc uh, from any angle because there'd be no depth to it so it would look a lot like a hole and so when you have these instances where the clouds are appearing around these holes i believe that's atmospheric disturbances occurring right. Right. from this phenomena and i believe what is occurring is these uh white orbs or glowing orbs um are either coming from the hole or blocking things coming out of the hole uh again it's it seems crazy to even speculate on such things but clearly this is something that has been witnessed just because mm. we haven't witnessed it today. Yeah, uh, yeah. it does not mean that uh, it hasn't been witnessed. And these people took great detail of, a, of daily accounts. That, that was their job. Um, and, and clearly something was going on here. What, what would your, uh, what would your interpretation of the bloody crucifix be? You know, I don't know. I, I almost want to dismiss it as a, a just an addition to the context because it, it was written uh, by a clergyman. Yeah. But, you know, it could be an artifact of a, an accidental cross or something. Uh, it could have been two object plasma trails that, that yeah. uh, were perpendicular. I don't then, know. Well, then we, we, you know, we're just we're just falling back on that whole uh, cultural uh, fabric and uh, an interpretation. That's uh, you know an interpretation because of the the religion and the perspective. Yeah. So yeah, um, makes sense. Well, that's again my interpretation. Skeptics can would argue about that immensely, and, and they had a, they have a right to. Uh, there's nothing I can point to yeah. to describe what is being referenced here, uh, just based on my knowledge of of physics and aerospace engineering just from my very limited perspective that's how i would describe these uh black spheres i, I believe that they're actually uh holes being opened up um and the clouds are atmospheric kind of uh dis dis disturbances from the holes you know who knows? Speculation. Uh, Yuan, China, 1639. Suddenly a luminous object like a star, red, white, yellow, and blue in color flew over the funeral procession. This brilliant thing did not touch the ground, but it flew around the village for a long time, then rose up into the sky. Its light was visible five miles away. Interesting. Another five kilometer measurement red white and blue blue this is the first instance of uh the term blue being used 
It could be that uh, previous references, when they're referencing the moon shaped, uh, that also could be bluish in color. But I find that interesting. Uh, red, white, yellow, and blue. And this was seen by many people at a, at a funeral to a, um, a person of authority. Limerick, Ireland, 1650. A luminous globe brighter than the moon shed a vertical light onto the city, and then it faded as it passed over the enemy camp. Again, a battle, a globe, a vertical light shaft. Essex, England, November 1660. Very early in the morning, two men saw a fiery cloud in the southwest. From under it appeared two bright objects as large as the moon, which began a dogfight in the atmosphere. One of them eventually grew dimmer while the other increased in size and remained in view for two hours, a great part of which time they saw streaming from it streams of fire and streams of blood. Then it diminished until it was no longer than an ordinary star. And this is uh, <laughs> the very primitive depiction of what, what, what they saw. Um, we have multiple accounts of these uh, dripping and, and uh, dropping things onto the ground or bleeding <clears throat> or perceived bleeding. I don't know what to make of that, to be honest with you. I don't know if they're dumping a fuel source or I don't know. It's, it's well, yeah. There's, there's a couple of interesting videos um, that have come out over the years of you know what almost appears to be like plasma dripping down from something or even by location of 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 maybe the same craft in terms of like some sort of strange space time issue because there's sometimes uh, I've I've seen a video I think it was actually a police cam video where you had a, a bright white kind of oval shaped orb and then these white orbs were kind of appearing below it and they were almost like they were dripping down but then they were starting up again so it's very hard to understand what exactly is going on yeah. there but i imagine maybe it could be something like that where you've got lights coming down or some sort of plasma dripping down that would be my only interpretation that i could think of well that that's inherent with the you know utilizing electrogravitic propulsion you're you're inherently bending uh space time yeah. and, and kind of a bubble and when you have a bubble it's uh it creates complete distortion depending on on the frequency so the you know the background images will get distorted images within the containment field will be distorted uh, so you have a tremendous amount of distortion occurring which would cause all sorts of uh, yeah. visual phenomena uh, germany april 1665 aerial ships and a saucer shaped object with dome were reported flying over the church of this town lo located near the baltic sea and hovered there till evening. Witnesses were left trembling with pain in their heads and limbs. Hmm. Hmm. Radiation, perhaps? Yeah. Being too close to the uh, the field. Well, we've we've you know we've had people speaking about that. We've had Hal Puts off talking about the uh, you know the biological effects uh, from field proximity to these types of uh, these types of craft. So that's something that we understand in a modern context. Yeah. Interesting. So now we're getting toward uh, modern times. So this was interesting. This was new to me and might be new to a lot of your uh, viewers. Mount Washington, USA, 1870. Mm. These will be uh, modern UAP references from 1700 AD to present. This photo was taken from Mount Washington in New Hampshire using a stereo camera to take photos of the clouds believed to be the first photo ever to depict objects yeah. in the sky prior to the invention of planes. Notice the shape, <laughs> uh, cigar shaped. And if you look closely, this is a stereo image. So you can see that it is uh, not an accidental error because it's slightly out of place. 
and that means that it's ha- it's a it's a slight distance uh, from the cloud and a distance from the camera. So the there is depth to it. I, I found that interesting. That's the first ever picture. South and Midwest USA, 1896-1897. Interesting depiction. Thousands of accounts nationwide of unusual, sometimes glowing aircraft moving erratically across the sky. Some accounts describe them as cigar-shaped and shiny metallic. These events lasted over a year with witnesses proclaiming their accounts in various newspapers. So this was in the 1800s. And again, we have an interesting cultural kind of uh, pathology where you see they're like now instead of sails they're depicting propellers yeah like zeppelins uh, airships you know right well they, right. but this is this is the time when there was a major flap of zeppelins yes. and airships and things like that yep yeah and there are you know there are cons- there's different uh ideas out there as to what they were some mm-hmm. uh describe them to be um, this uh, German group of uh, aeronautical engineers who were designing aircraft prior to the Wright brothers. Yeah, I think, I think that falls into the Sonora Aero Club. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, I, I find these accounts interesting because they kind of loosely meet our criteria. Uh, and we have, I have no other accounts of the Sonora Aero Club, uh, Aero Club. So, and, and they just perfectly match previous, uh, yeah. sort of descriptions, glowing lights, uh, cylindrical in shape, metallic, uh, this time we have propellers instead of sails. That's really, yeah. that's the only difference I've, I've found. Well, that, that was something I found interesting about the Zeppelins because, uh, or the airships, because, you know, the, the whole, the Sonora Aero Club, I mean, there could be some truth to that. But what I found interesting with quite a few of the accounts from the 1800s uh, flap of, uh, of airships was that they were still reporting like highly erratic movement, high speed, like high velocity, and it would just blink, it, you know, blink away in, the, in, 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 yeah. in a moment. And so it, it does seem, again, like you were saying, that it, it might be some sort of psychological, uh, you know, damage control for people looking up at something and placing a template over it, which is an airship. But these are obviously, uh, they were not behaving the way that airships behave. So uh, there's something, something about that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it could be a little of both. There's no right, reason right. why uh, why all of these references that we've covered thus far uh, just stopped uh, during the 1800s yeah, yeah. specifically. And then all of a sudden, the Sonora Aero Club is the only UAP being observed. I highly doubt that. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably a little of both. I think uh, I can't imagine that they were so massive in scale that – this air club had hundreds of craft, but yeah, maybe they did. Yeah. Otago, New Zealand, 1909. Hundreds of people witnessed many glowing spheres flying above the ground, following the landscape at extreme speeds, uh, quote, flowing over the hills and dipping into valleys. Hmm. Okay. Portugal, October 1917. Uh, Newspapers published testimony from witnesses 30,000 plus who said that they had seen extraordinary solar activities such as the sun glowing sphere appearing to dance or zigzag in the sky, careen towards the earth, or emit multicolored light and radiant colors. According to these reports, the event lasted approximately 10 minutes. So this was a big deal back then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's a lot of people. But again... We have another orb uh, showing itself in front of a group of people. If I'm if I'm right, I believe there was the appearance of what was understood at the time to be the Virgin Mary or something. Three three children witnessed the appearance of a figure who then uh, informed them to basically tell their town and their village that, that some spectacular event was going to take place, and that is why you had this huge crowd gathered because word had got out. That essentially, if I'm if I'm correct, the the Virgin Mary had uh, you know pro- prophesized of an event was going to take place, and then obviously this uh, this took place. 
Yeah, I, I I read about that, but I you know other, aside from the actual occurrence, uh, I I can't really say as to the validity of the narrative prior to the occurrence. Um, mm-hmm. That could be true. It could be very true. Uh, but what we do know is that this actually happened. Mm-hmm. What led up to it, I'm not sure. Uh, it also could have been that uh, a village of people saw this this thing happening and and everybody started walking toward it and, and looking at it but you you know you could be right who knows that i don't speculate on on that sort of soft analytics where you know you start talking about the interaction of, of with people and individuals uh, only because i can't i can't detail that as a defined metric as a as a point per se although saying that there has been a bit of a trend of apparently uh you know female entities appearing to people and giving some strange sort of prophecy or you know i mean a good example yeah. is chris bledsoe and the bledsoe family and uh, you know this whole issue of the, yeah. the white appearing and um, and then you have the the buffalo calf woman uh, who appeared to the Native Americans. So that there is there is definitely some trend there, of. There's of, also ancient accounts right, of right. Uh, female goddesses. I didn't include them uh, because that uh, that's an entirely different yeah, sort yeah. of trend that I would be looking at. And, and like I said at the beginning, I really wanted to curate this data uh, just based on observational yeah, yeah. Uh, da- visual data uh, that kind of correlates to what we're observing now. Los Angeles, 1942. Everyone knows about this one. Unidentified aerial objects trigger the firing of thousands of anti-aircraft rounds and raise the wartime alert status. Witnessed by thousands of California residents and servicemen described as both metallic saucers and glowing spheres. So this was huge at the time. It was absolutely massive. And it, it, there's a naval base out there uh, by, in Santa Barbara, I think. I, I don't know if it was there at the time. Do you know if it was there in 42? Sorry, I had myself on mute. No, I, oh, don't, okay. I don't know. So I know that they had some sort of operation going. Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, <laughs> they wouldn't have had all the servicemen there. So I find that interesting that they engaged them uh, to such a degree. And there's so many witnesses. Uh, you can't really deny that that occurred. Even as a skeptic, what are you going to say? It's uh, you know a foreign country, but nothing was shot down by all accounts. These things. Uh, yeah, the rounds and, were just slipping yeah. off them. They fired a lot of rounds. Happen. Yeah, they fired yep. a lot of rounds at that and nothing came down. Well, that would happen if you're firing into a gravitic field. Yeah. It would just slip around it. Uh, it wouldn't have like a, an impact. Western Europe, November 1944. Uh, Donald J. Mayer's radar operator for the uh, 415th night fighter squadron initially coined the term foo fighters to describe the objects seen both visually by infantrymen and via radar by himself the foo fighters are described as glowing spheres that move erratically and followed both planes and ships during wartime operations thousands of servicemen with the allies made formal statements of their respective observations so this is a very well documented um, occurrence throughout the war. Both, I, th- I think, both the the Nazis and, and Allies uh, kind of described these objects. Yeah, but I think I think both thought it was the weapon of the other. Uh, you know, we we thought it might be some sort of uh, Wunderwaffe uh, for, from the Axis side, and uh, I believe the Nazis were also concerned that this was some sort of Ally super weapon. So uh, we were all confused by these. Yeah, we we're confused, but uh, uh, there exists n- no uh, credible information that I could find in these uh, spheres having direct engagement in the passive wartime operation. So mm. if they weren't being targeted or attacked themselves, they never inter- intervened. Yeah, just from, observing. From- 
just observing basically observing massive wartime efforts again yeah. which which to be honest you probably would if you were an intelligence that had some level of interest in this planet if there were massive wars going on i'm sure you'd take a peek yeah yeah mount rainier usa june 1947 Private pilot Kenneth Arnold claimed that he saw a string of nine shiny, unidentified flying objects flying past Mount Rainier at speeds that Arnold estimated at a minimum of 1,200 miles an hour. I don't know how he figured that out, but I guess in res respect to your own speed, you could figure that out. This was the first post-World uh, War II sighting in the United States that garnered nationwide news coverage and is credited with being the first of the modern era of UFO sightings, including numerous report, reported sightings over the next two to three weeks. Pretty interesting, some of these patterns, huh, that, that you really never connected until you see them in chronological order yeah, it's all over the world. It's fascinating. And it's, it's you know, <clears throat> like we were saying before, it's, it's beyond... Being able to simply dismiss, you know, one or two cases once you kind of compile it into a into a network, it becomes so much harder to uh, dismiss. I don't know how you could. Uh, I don't know how you you would be defying logical analysis yeah. if you yeah. were to argue this. And at that point, you're no longer arguing on the base of um, skepticism. Yeah. You're arguing on the base of, of bias. illogical bias. Alabama, USA, July 1948. Chile saw a dull red glow above and ahead of the aircraft. He told Witted, look, here comes a new army jet job. Childs and Witted stated that the object looked like a wingless aircraft. It seemed to have two rows of windows through which glowed a very bright light, as brilliant as a magnesium flare. Both pilots claimed the object was 100 feet long and 25 to 30 feet in diameter, torpedo, torpedo or cigar shaped. So I believe what, they're, what they saw here was the kind of plasma illumination that, occur, that would occur kind of at the circumference of the, the visual object uh, if it had a field enabled. Um, you're basically kind of utilizing a tremendous amount of voltage in, in an ionizing atmosphere. And what that does is releases uh, illumination or light based off whatever gases in, in that area. But maybe they did see windows. That, that would be interesting. I mean, what, what, what would purpose would windows be for a craft that could just use cameras? I don't know. North Dakota, USA, <clears throat> 1948. George Gorman was a veteran fighter pilot of World War II. On October the 1st, 1948, Gorman was participating in a cross-country flight with the other National Guard pilots when they came across an erratically flying ball of light. He tried to engage the object when its light grew in intensity and sped up, zigzagged, and shot directly up into the sky claimed is supported by two other civil pilots who were nearby and witnessed the glowing sphere flying around and local air traffic controller L.D. Jensen. And here's a little sketch of uh, how the movements that these objects made uh, from George Gorman's perspective. And you can see that they did a big circle and then kind of flew around as he engaged them and then disappeared. Notice confidential. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Tokyo, Japan, October 1952. U.S. Air Force Tower operators at Hadena Air Force Base observed an unusually bright bluish white light uh, to their northeast, alerted the uh, radar. Uh, object confirmed by both radar and the pilot in pursuit. The target then accelerated out of the F. 94's radar range after 90 seconds of pursuit that was followed also on the uh, GCI radar. So the, basically they had visual confirmation and radar confirmation of this erratic flying sphere. And then they tried to pursue it and it just, just disappeared. Florence, Italy, October, 1954. 
a football game between uh, two teams was underway at the Stadio uh, Artemio when a group of UFOs traveling at high speed abruptly stopped over the stadium. The stadium became silent as the crowd of around 10,000 spectators witnessed the event and described the UFOs as cigar-shaped and glowing spheres. You know, uh, it's beginning, it's hard to argue at this point as we've traversed ancient history to modern day that uh, this isn't a real phenomenon. I, I, I don't know how you could argue against this. The White House, USA, uh, it's not, not just the White House, but D.C. General, December 1952. Over the course of a few days in and around the D.C. area, radar operators from nearby Andrews Air Force Base and local witnesses saw objects flying around the sky described as bright spheres and flying disks. And this was a photo of a, a meeting between some officials discussing the reports at a news conference. And I didn't know that they had hearing aids in 1952. I found that to be interesting. No, I didn't know that either. So there were so many um, instances to, to look at that I just didn't have the time. But what I did was I went through all the instances, and instead of making slides, I kind of charted them in a table. And it's a curated list of additional data points that are represent, you know, represented by credible witnesses who are either trained observers uh, and or depicted uh, via transcribed military records. So uh, I tried to look for the, the most credible uh, sources. Each account listed contains descriptions of either glowing spheres, metallic disks, or cigar-shaped objects. Not included are single testimonies from civilians or uncooperated accounts. So from 1959 to 1974, we have a ton of documented instances. Uh, These are all either military or accounts by individuals of, of notoriety or note. And uh, your viewers can can look at these slides uh, when we post them later. But you can see there's a lot. Then from 76 to 97, we have some of the major ones that we're aware of. Uh, Let's see. The Gulf Breeze UFO incident, uh, Phoenix Lights. Everybody knows about that. And then from 2004 to... The present day, we have the Mexican UFO incident, USS uh, Nimitz case, um, uh, Roosevelt UFO incidents, uh, and New Mexico pilots uh, sighting UFOs. That was uh, recently. So, you know, we hear this argument a lot that the government is too stupid and bureaucratic to be able to cover something like this up. Uh, surely, you know, it would have been leaked by now. There would be proof or evidence. Uh, you know, we also hear if there are such things as UAP, why hasn't anyone of like serious authority ever come forward? Well, to those arguments, I, I have uh these these witness te- testimonies uh which i think people find interesting james forrestal uh was the first secretary of defense of the united states and former secretary of the navy president truman authorized operation majestic 12 with this 1947 letter uh there's some skepticism about the uh authentication of the letter but from from my research it seemed pretty pretty authentic the perpetuated reason for mj12 is believed to act as a think tank uh, research threat assess and reverse engineer the crafts being encountered by the military it's not a stretch uh they're obviously documented uh occurrences that the military was witnessing 
Um, whether they acknowledged it or not, they clearly documented it. They had servicemen documenting it. It was a big deal. So when the military sees something as a big deal, they enact something. And this came from the president at the time. It started MJ-12 as a think tank. Uh, per this memorandum, Forrestal set up the micro department of MJ-12. An account suggests that at some point Forrestal felt as though the information on the phenomenon must be released to the public. Uh, there's a lot of stipulation. No one really knows what happened uh, toward the end of his career and life. He was later placed in, the, in a military mental asylum where he f accidentally fell out of his 16th floor room. Um, nobody at the time really believed that. Uh, and if you really read the research now, it, it's very implausible that that's what occurred. Uh, prior to Forrestal's, uh, I'll, I'll call it what it is, assassination, I think there's a typo there. He and a young JFK became friendly, and to some accounts, Forrestal's uh, actually mentored him, citing a clear relationship in which inside information was likely shared. If you're two powerful individuals, uh, I find it absolutely implausible that you're not going to share uh, information between yeah. each other. Yeah. They later flew together to Germany after the war to meet with local officials and to see areas of interest. And you can see their relationship here. They're in uh, Germany here getting a tour of sites of interest. And here they are again. And then here's JFK, uh, older now, visiting Forrestal's grave, and this was found in uh, JFK's archive online uh, with the reference number. So there's a clear relationship between them. Interestingly, both uh, perished in, in uh, abnormal ways. Dr. Oppenheimer, first director of the Los Alamos Laboratory, and Albert Einstein. We know them from the Manhattan Project, but what many don't know is that they drafted a top secret memo to President Truman regarding their belief on how we should navigate the phenomenon. Uh, both held clearances at the highest level uh, you would if, if you were the director at Los Alamos and also Albert Einstein. Um, both Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer and Einstein wrote uh, President Truman a top secret memo kind of discussing how we should navigate the phenomenon and their belief to have a non-militaristic response to the occurrences. Uh, this letter was uh, intercepted and you'll see, oh, I guess we're missing a slide, but there's a letter that uh, they wrote and I had, a, I had a photo of it and at the bottom, is a note from another official uh, responding to Oppenheimer and Einstein and stating that the president probably wouldn't find it uh, interesting or pursue their uh, tact. And your viewers can just go online and that, that, uh, that six-page um, letter. Oh, okay, it's a six-page letter. I was going to say I could put it up on screen in post, but uh, we'll put a link in the description box below for everyone and make sure that's available. It may have got shuffled, so it might be in a future slide. So then we have Rear Admiral Byrd of Hop Operation High Jump, uh, 1946 to 1947. Uh, Admiral Byrd led a massive convoy of over 4,000 troops to Antarctica to look for post-war hidden Nazi encampments. Uh, at the time, it was believed the Nazis had amassed a force in Antarctica and were conducting weapons research and, and just kind of regrouping. Uh, when Admiral Byrd's forces arrived, they were met by flying disks and glowing orbs, and Byrd's forces suffered a tremendous loss. Upon his return, Byrd was placed under strict control and ordered to remain silent on behalf of humanity, which I find uh, interesting to to kind of, you know, when you have a, a military man of such rank, generally they're uh, quite noble uh, from 
you know, my knowledge of history and, and individuals of uh, high regard. And if you kind of, if you are wanting them to remain quiet, you appeal to their desire to protect uh, society or civilians. And, and it seems like that's what they did uh, for the betterment of humanity. Where, where does the uh, where does the testimony about high jump come from? I'm guessing it wasn't Bird who who made this account. If he was sworn to not talk about it, he did. Uh, he did make some mentions. Uh, I, I I did come across some casual mentions. There was leaked uh, CIA uh, or later at the time it wasn't the CIA, but there was some leaked documents. Those can be found online. Um, there was enough information that I found it to be uh, credible. There was also information from servicemen uh, at the time who, who spoke on it. Uh, it's very easily researched and, and vetted, but again, it's, uh, it's the military account, so it's hard. At this point in history, I, it's almost harder to believe modern accounts than the ancient accounts, which is uh, bizarre if you think of it, <laughs> if you think about it. You know, because today's accounts get skewed by so much disinformation yeah, or purposeful yeah. uh, disinformation. But here's that letter that I talked about uh, from Oppenheimer and Einstein. It, this, it was just bumped up a slide. But it's a six-page letter. Uh, it talks about uh, the phenomenon, uh, the, you know, extraterrestrials. I don't think they call them that. But uh, it's fascinating. And then you have this little note here that was appended by whoever intercepted this letter that was meant for the president. And it states, myself and Marshall have read this, and I must admit there is some logic, but I have, but I hard think the pres president will consider it for obvious reasons. I understand Oppenheimer approached Marshall about or something they attended at redacted. As I understand it, Marshall rebuffed the idea of Oppenheimer discussing this with the president. I talked to Gordon and he agreed. So basically they're like, no, we're not giving this to the president, uh, which I, uh, I think is interesting. Warner Von Braun. The, the infamous Von Braun, 1912, 1977. Warner was originally the uh, top Nazi scientist who paved the way for modern uh, rocketry. He was later ported into the U.S. intelligence hierarchy via the secret operation titled Paperclip. Um, he came to the U.S. with over 1,000 other notable scientists who were quickly put to work. Warner was eventually assigned the post of NASA's deputy associate administrator. After his role with NASA, he moved on to become the VP of Fairchild Industries. And at the time, uh, Fairchild was basically, you know, the high tech capital of the world at the time. It, it was like the premier tech company. Toward the end of his life and dying of cancer, uh, Warner confided in his uh, I, I believe very noteworthy protege, Dr. Carol Rosen. Uh, I find her noteworthy um, because not only was she the first executive, uh, female executive for Fairchild, but being a female in that time in the aerospace sector, and not only a female, but a leader of one of the, uh, the prestigious uh, companies is, is a big deal. So she's, she's definitely legit. And she, she worked uh, with uh, Warner as an aide and kind of a liaison for uh, the public, but they spoke and met often. And she stated that, there, that Warner had confided to her that there was a long multi-decade schedule to weaponize space and that they would use the very real phenomenon as a means to drum up fear and subsequently supplement the directive. Warner also disclosed to her that there was already anti-gravitic technology available deep within the military industrial complex. You know, uh, this is her word uh, against 
skeptics, but, uh, you know, somebody like Warner Von Braun, who, you know, ha held such uh, seats of prominence in the military industrial complex and always also had uh, access to some of the highest uh, aerospace technologies at the time, uh, he would be one to know. And he also probably had a lot on his conscience uh, for some of the things he was involved in uh, for his life and probably you know, felt tremendous guilt. And I think it was uh, a little move for him to disclose this stuff, to, to kind of get it off his shoulders before he died uh, to Carol Rosen, who, you know, in her own right was a esteemed professional in, in business and science and technology. And, you know, talking about this stuff does nothing for her credibility. So I tend to believe that uh, he probably did tell her this stuff. And if you get deeper into Von Braun's history and some of the things he discussed, uh, it's pretty staggering uh, what has occurred and what he kind of uh, presented as a, as a scheduled timeline uh, as to what would happen and when it happened. And it's uh, his timeline is still uh happening today so he's been pretty accurate with his predictions lieutenant colonel philip james corso 1915 1998 corso was a decorated officer who sat on the staff of president eisenhower's national security council for four years he later became chief of the pentagon's foreign technology desk in army research and development his job there as as he personally described it was primarily to oversee the reverse engineering programs of UAP crafts. Uh, Corso claims he stewarded extraterrestrial artifacts recovered from a crash near Roswell in 1947. He later became a battalion commander and then inspector general for the U.S. Army in 1959. So this guy is a legit military man. Uh, clearly moved up in the ranks and you don't do that by being a guy who's wishy-washy or makes things up. Uh, the only way you move through the ranks uh, like that is to be somebody who's very useful and somebody who gets things done. And based on, on his accounts, he did both of those things. According to Corso, the reverse engineering of these artifacts indirectly led to the development of accelerated particle beam devices, fiber optics, lasers, integrated circuit chips, and Kevlar material. This was accomplished by laundering the tech through secretive corporate channels. So that's a lot to take in. Um, if we're operating under the premise uh, that this phenomenon is real, which we've seen, uh, the government has clearly been engaged in covering it up. Uh, the, the military is well aware of it. Um, following that logic, somebody at some point would have been in charge of uh, reverse engineering. Somebody had to be in charge. And it appears that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corso was that guy for a time. And he describes what I find to be very interesting how they utilized uh, corporate back channels. That, that happens a lot today. Uh, kind of shell companies that exist to release uh, new, newly developed technologies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that still happens today. So he, he was describing this uh, prior to that being public knowledge, which I, I believe gives some further credibility. He was an interesting character, but I guess you would be if you were exposed to to that sort of technology. Yes. William Tompkins. This is an interesting case. Uh, William Bill was a child prodigy. Uh, as a child, he would create uh, models of naval ships, uh, I guess, as all prodigies would do. They would hyper-focus on some uh, random and obscure uh, thing. But he became uh, very skilled at just looking at a naval ship uh, either from a newspaper picture or via his own eyes by going to see the Navy ships that were ported at the, the piers. And so he appeared on, on <laughs> one afternoon or one evening 
uh, a Navy officer saw one of his uh, models and was startled to find that he had accurately placed uh, weaponry that, that was classified and, and not, um, not publicly known on the ship and at proper scale and dimension. And so the, this Navy official was like, what the, what the heck is going on? And then they discover that it's this uh, young boy who had, with a photographic memory was creating these models. And so they waited till he was about 17. And then obviously they brought him into the Navy intelligence community. And from there, Bill claims that he was exposed to materials from off world while at the Navy and then throughout his career while he worked within highly classified think tanks designing advanced weapons for aerospace companies, including North American Aviation, Northrop and Douglas. Uh, he even assisted with the Saturn and Apollo space programs for NASA. So he's a very legitimate and credentialed uh, gentleman. And, you know, some of his claims are, are quite amazing. I didn't include them all. Uh, but again, just like Corso, we have a guy who's clearly brilliant he clearly worked in aerospace and for secretive think tanks, and he's saying pretty much the same sort of stuff. Yes, we uh, were reverse engineering these things. Um, the technology is there. It's uh, underneath corporate uh, channels. Uh, again, that's a trend in modern day history Yeah, uh, that we're observing. Well, he... Uh... I, I'm pretty sure it was um, it was William Tompkins who s spoke about Solar Warden. I think it was uh, Solar Warden was the code name. I think that was for the creation of some of these platforms that he was apparently designing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some. Uh, so I, I didn't get into that, but yeah, he uh, according to him, and then later Gary McKinnon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that the infamous hacker, um, William Tompkins was part of the team that were drafting uh, the Navy's reverse engineered mm. response to the UAP. So at this point in history, uh, the military had uh, deduced enough where they were uh, replicating very primitive uh, types of craft uh, that could utilize some of the same um, principles that the UAP and it, and I you know they don't have to understand fully how it works and and you don't ever need to when you're engineering and redesign or reverse engineering you can take uh, some widget and kind of plug it into whatever design you want to implement it in and not necessarily understand it from A to B, but enough to utilize it. Uh, we can do that with like a, a, a car, somebody or an electric car, somebody who doesn't know much about how an electric car operates could, you know, feasibly take a motor out and swap it with a new one or, or something like that. So it's interesting and I find it to be credible which is why I include it. it it's credible in that it, it corroborates a trend in, in uh, some of these soft data sources. President Jimmy Carter, 1973. Um, he described waiting outside for a Lions Club meeting in Georgia to begin about 7.30 p.m. when he spotted what he called the darndest thing I've ever seen in the sky, Carter, as well as 10 to 12 other people who witnessed the same event described the object as very bright with changing colors and about the size of the moon. Carter reported the object hovered about 30 degrees above the horizon and moved in toward the earth and away before disappearing into the distance. He later told a uh, reporter that after the experience, he vowed never again to ridicule anyone who claimed to have seen a UFO. Maybe Carter wasn't read into to everything and i think that's kind of a modern a modern approach that probably started after uh, bush senior um, or around there i don't think all presidents are read into uh, these reverse engineered crafts because i don't think it's uh 
it's a different kind of issue now. It's no longer an issue of how do we reverse engineer it because I think that's already happened. Um, so I don't think there's need to notify standing presidents who only sit for four years with that sort of information. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14. Uh, this is his quote, White Sands was a testing ground for atomic weapons, and that's what the extraterrestrials were interested in. They wanted to know about our military capabilities. My own experience talking to people has made it clear that ETs have been attempting to keep us from going to war and help create peace on Earth. So Ed, Edgar Mitchell, you know, he, he's, he's a man of note. Uh, he stood on the moon. So there's very few people who can say that. And to be an astronaut, it means a certain type of character, a character that uh, almost certainly stipulates that you wouldn't obsessively lie about something or um, just be wishy-washy about any, really anything. There, there are some of the most trained professionals on the planet in multiple different uh, fields. So uh, I find his analysis to be credible and interesting yeah well uh, another interesting thing about edgar mitchell was that he um he consistently stated for the record i have never personally witnessed uh, a ufo and he he said that because he was actually sworn into secrecy through i was just gonna uh, say it, yeah if he, you're under a, a you know a non-disclosure uh you you can't you yeah. have to lie yeah. So that's not a reflection of his character. That's no, no, I, I, I was actually going to say it, it bolsters his character because he obviously adhered to the NDA restrictions yes. of his uh, flight uh, missions to on, on the Apollo missions, but was very outspoken about, uh, you know, other people's experiences and the research that he had, he had uh, you know, uh, undertaken himself. So I, I know I think it bolsters his credibility that he was obviously willing to uh, be a patriot and hold back on what he had signed off on saying he would never talk about, but it has later come out that he did indeed have uh, experiences on the Apollo missions um, with, with UFOs. Yeah. Yeah. And he wasn't the only astronaut. He was just uh, the only one I included. I yeah. found uh, yeah. a couple others. So Bob Lazar, we all know him. Um, anyone who's researched uh, this topic at all uh, is knowledgeable. For those who, who are not not knowledgeable about Bob Lazar, uh, he was a small town mechanical and rocket genius. Uh, that can't be argued. Uh, Bob was discovered by individuals working at the White Sands National Laboratory, also you know known as uh, Area 51 or S4. According to him, and he didn't know it at the time, they were having trouble with the reverse engineering of off-world crafts and thought that a different perspective might be helpful. Uh, Bob claims that he was charged with trying to better understand the technology behind the craft, but found it impossible due to the levels of compartmentalization. After bringing his friends to see the reverse engineered craft in flight at the S-4 facility, he ultimately lost his position and was strategically discredited by the intelligence community. Bob later described how UFOs operate from a physics perspective, and uh, as I could find, his uh, description was the most accurate and uh, account of how these things uh, could be operating in terms of actual mathematics and physics. Uh, I found that very interesting. Uh, and then he reported that they had at S4 stable samples of the element 115, which at the time of his whistleblowing had not been discussed publicly and only a few theoretical chemists had, had even theories of. Uh, it wasn't until the 2000s when the element was officially discovered. Uh, so, you know, not only does that provide credibility, but, you know, the government said that he never worked for naval intelligence. Uh, he clearly proves that because <laughs> he kept his uh, pay stub. Um, and then I think it was one of the reporters, George, uh, George, George Knapp, Knapp, I, George Knapp, I yeah. think, investigated and, and found Bob Lazar's name in the S4 uh, phone listing. Uh, so he clearly was there, uh, despite what the uh, intelligence community claims. Um, what's interesting is that we have counter narratives now. We have Bob Lazar in 1989, 
saying, you know, they were trying to reverse engineer this specific craft. And, uh, but he took his friends to see some of the other craft flying around. At this time, Colonel Corso and William Tompkins had both stated uh, that we had the technology for uh, electrogravitic levitation available. So I'm wondering if Bob was brought on to look at this specific craft, if this craft was of a different design, or if he was brought on um, simply because uh, he was a bit of a loose cannon. And, and I'm sure anyone in the intelligence community knows that you profile all, all, all people that you're bringing into the fold. And it could have been intentional in that they knew this guy would, uh, you know, would uh, release the information and kind of just further discredit it, but it actually went the other direction. Robert Bigelow, the National Institute for Discovery Science, 1995-2004. Uh, Bob was a billionaire prior to getting into the aerospace research. He founded NIDS in the hopes of answering some of the largest, larger questions surrounding UAP and other related uh, anomalous phenomenon. Uh, during this time, he made important connections in NASA and the DOD, which led him to start his own aerospace company that worked with NASA on several highly classified projects. Uh, Bob Bigelow himself is interesting, but when you start to look at his network, uh, it becomes even more interesting. So according to him and key members of his team, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff and Dr. Eric Davis, who are both entrenched military intelligence scientists, they were exposed to off-world material that derived from crash vehicles. Both Dr. Hal Putoff and Dr. Eric Davis uh, have been in the public more recently. Um, Dr. Eric Davis for the Wilson uh, leaks uh, which is uh, Admiral Wilson's acknowledgement <laughs> of his uh, desire to get into the uh, secretive U UAP kind of um, projects, but he couldn't get into it. And uh, Eric Davis happened to be on listed on that memo as well. So there, there is a direct connection with a lot of what's going on and uh, UAP in general. But it furthers that narrative that the government has has craft in its possession, uh, has material. I think that there's several different programs being run that don't communicate, and you kind of get this weird sort of juggling around, um, and it's all ultra compartmentalized, and no one really has a clear picture. But I, I do believe we we have reverse engineered these crafts. And we have Luis Elizondo. Uh, he's kind of the forerunner in today's uh, UAP sort of uh, public face. He was a former counterintelligence special agent and former employee of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. He ran and directed the classified uh, ATIP program where they gathered information and media pertaining to UAP. Uh, Louis was pivotal in the release of the USS mass sighting case, the USS Nimitz, and presently assists Christopher Mellon, former staff director of the United States Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, in bringing Congress up to speed regarding the phenomenon. On several occasions, uh, he has stated that these crafts and his analysis are not from this world. And I would take the word from a guy who ran the department on uh, uh, on advanced aerospace threat identification program. <laughs> uh, I think he is familiar with what is ours and what is not. Uh, he ultimately left the, the program to make it public because it, his uh, appeals to higher ups in, in the chain of command were going unheard. And he thought it was a matter of national consequence. At least that's what he says. So, my informal analysis on, on all of this, uh, UAP are real and have been here for many thousands of years. Do they you know, predate ancient history? How far back do they go? There's no way to know, uh, but they clearly have been identified uh, pretty far back. 
Um, they're clearly interested in conflict and nuclear technology, which we see in later, later day uh, modern history. Uh, there appears to be different factions. And, you know, we discussed that the accounts of them of the UAP engaging and acting erratically with each other and kind of bashing into each other and, and spilling plasma, uh, different shaped craft. I think all of that leads to uh, the fact that there's different factions, I guess, if that's what you call them, different, uh, yeah, different, different deviations. And they appear pretty much benign and somewhat indifferent. I mean, they do have accounts of interactions. Those are harder to validate uh, simply because that's, uh, you know, usually a one person interpretation. Um, but on the most, on, on a whole, they don't really uh, interact, um, which I find interesting. I, I, I look at it as akin to if you're a uh, research biologists and you're in the dense jungle and you're studying a rare gorilla pack, you're going to try to stay hidden. But if they see you, ultimately, you, you don't really care. You, you just, you don't want to, to interact with them that would change their natural behavior. Unless, of course, you wanted to change their natural behavior. And in that situation, you would do something uh, interesting, like change the color of your emission and, and zigzag around or, you know, create interesting visualizations in the sky. Uh, but on a whole, they seem somewhat benign and seem just interested in observation. So the big question, and this is, you know, huge in, in uh, the UAP, Twitter, and the phenomenon, and culture wars, and the military, are they a threat? Well, I think, I think they could be. They're, they're not presently, but I, I look at it like this. So there seems to be a fundamental rule in the evolution of complex organisms and respective technologies. So technology is born only out of a necessity to increase the survivability of an organism from a hostile environment. Think of everything hum humans have ever developed from fire to a spear. We did those things to increase our survivability. So over time and through the ability to transcribe history and teach your, your, you know, your children and your children's children, technology becomes better at improving the life of the organisms wielding it without conflict, whether with the organisms or the environment itself, there would be no evolutionary pressure to increase capabilities. What this means is that any civilization that possesses the capabilities of the observed phenomenon must inherently be to some degree hostile hostile to its former environment where it evolved or hostile to other organisms. Otherwise, the need for technical development would be inconsequential and never pursued. You don't derive with advanced, uh, at least not in our understanding, you, you don't pursue this linear trend of technological development for the sake of uh, curiosity. You have to look at it from the beginning of the whoever or whatever this this is, they started at some point. Where they started, they had to have created very primitive tools. And why would they have done that? Uh, to increase their survivability or to better situate themselves within their environment. And that initiates a cascading effect that I believe would occur in any intelligent civilization. And I think that's what we're seeing. So when we, when we have people like uh, Stephen Greer, who proclaim that, that uh, these are peaceful and 100% peaceful, I have, to, I have to wonder that uh, they're, they're not considering this very valid uh, point that I, I have uh, 
come to the the technology must be derived from hostile intent it doesn't mean that you're malaligned or that you uh love disaster or love to or or enjoy creating carnage it just means that at some point in your history you are hostile to your natural environment or other organisms whom you were trying to uh, be out of your equation. And, and that's my analysis. Yeah, and I would agree with that in terms of obviously evolutionary uh, competition and how it would, at least from a human perspective, because that's all we have to rely upon, it seems uh, impossible for that type of aggression to not come from, as you say, a history of either fighting against your environment or yourselves in some way. Um, but I suppose one thing we could look at with that is that perhaps they've reached that level of technological uh, evolution and perhaps philosophical evolution where the necessity of violence, the necessity of conflict is no longer an issue. I mean, obviously I'm speculating and perhaps these are now exploratory vessels of some sort and, and their civilization has adapted to the point where they're looking to explore the cosmos and, and learn rather than develop weapons platforms and, you know, offensive platforms. But I would agree with you that if these are beings with technologies, if we're, if we're not talking about some sort of interdimensional strangeness that we can't even fathom, if they, if they are extraterrestrials with highly evolved technologies, then yeah, I, I would imagine at some point in their history, there must have been a level of conflict for that type of technology to arrive. But I, I, I like to, you know, I, yeah, Dr. Stephen Greer with the whole, every single one of them is peaceful. That's, that's not something that I can accept just on a, on a logic basis. Uh, I don't think that that's uh, an assumption that we can really make, but I would be open to the idea that, you know, these, civilizations have perhaps reached what I think we need to reach, which is a symbiosis between uh, science and spirituality or physics and metaphysics and technology and consciousness, you know, and, uh, and perhaps they do represent a potential pathway that we could take, which is a more peaceful evolution through science and an underlying appreciation for the fundamentals of reality but uh, obviously that's just my own personal uh, you know optimistic bias that i would like to put it's towards as good, it's as good as any i mean we really have no idea and we know that the universe is inherently hostile that's why they have crafts to begin with otherwise right. they would just kind of walk through space so it's hostile to the development of an organism but that hostility uh that difficulty is what uh, kind of nurtures a yeah. complex intelligence into developing these technological capabilities. Which, you know, in a, in a strange way, makes it not necessarily hostile, but a prerequisite for development. Yeah. 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 Well, you need to forge, uh, uh, you need to fire and forge a, a metal to, that, yeah. to harden it. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and that that goes for the same for human character. Like anyone who's never had a hardship yeah, is yeah. generally somebody you don't want to be friends with because it's impossible to empathize yeah. with uh, anybody if you've never had an, a hardship to, to draw from. Uh, they tend to make the worst friends, <laughs> people who've <laughs> never experienced any difficulty in life or adversity. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was... Um... That was a brilliant presentation. My goodness, we went from BC to AD to present day. Like you took us on a on an absolute chronological journey through the phenomenon. I mean, that was a fantastic presentation, Mikai. Well, thank you. I what I what I hope we accomplished here was to string together uh, the accounts throughout time into one dialogue. Into mm. instead of being individualized and, and kind of swatting it away we saw clear trends statistical statistically significant trends yeah. of and patterns in, in uh referencing and description um you know if you're 
a debunker. I, I, and I appreciate healthy skepticism. The problem is when skepticism becomes cynicism yeah. on, on, on the simple behalf of uh, uh, a non-belief or something of yeah. that nature. Uh, when you're looking at a trend analysis like this, but you know, on a smaller scale with more hard facts and data points, and you come to a conclusion, like you you can argue that conclusion, but at some point you're simply arguing for the sake of a belief and not yeah. the logical conclusion of the data. And what what I hope we accomplished here was that we now see a pattern clearly in the data. Uh, certain trends have existed throughout recorded history. We see a pattern of how modern day uh, military industrial complex uh, treats this uh, phenomenon. We see a pattern of what they do with it. And, you know, we can extrapolate what's occurring now. I, I you know, I really uh, believe in uh, Warner Von Braun's uh, detailed kind of uh, narrative that he told Dr. Uh, Rosen that uh, this was this was a schedule. This was a long planned out schedule. And in that schedule, he details like first we'll have, you know, the threat will be X and then it yeah, will like be the Russian, this, the Chinese and extremists. The Chinese, and then, and then, then it'll be extremists, yeah. which we saw. And, and then it will yeah. be the threat narrative of extraterrestrials. And they can use that threat narrative because it's a real phenomenon that they can draw off of. And, and when you can control the narrative in a manner that generates fear, and, and, and people are more willing to follow whatever the mm. military uh, industrial complex wants to pursue, whether that's the militarization, uh, militarization of space, which is already happening if it hasn't already. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think they're really piggybacking off the actual uh, UAP phenomenon itself. Yeah. I mean, I, ha I have to, I have to admit, I, I feel if they, if they're trying to get people to be terrified of the phenomenon, they're doing, pardon my French, a piss poor job of that because um, people aren't really terrified of it. The Congress people aren't terrified of it. You know, they, it's being addressed as a potential <clears throat> national security threat. Obviously, there's you know the penetration into secure sites and strategic nuclear assets, and people are concerned about that. But I feel like if they if they wanted to unless we're just in the middle part of a long game and we've got all of this to look forward to in the next couple of years. I just feel like if they wanted to drum up a real fear that would kind of catalyze the populations of the world to support the weaponization of space, it's not really happening through this, um, uh, you know, like disclosure rollout. It's, it's not really being put on that strongly. Uh, you know, even, uh, people like Lou Elizondo are saying, well, we, you know, we don't know it's a threat, but we have to look at it through this angle. I'm from the DOD. We look at things in a, in a threat perspective. So they're, they're kind of explaining it in a way that puts people at ease with the idea of it being considered a national security threat. So, I mean, I, I'm wondering what you think about this. This is something I wanted to ask you. Um, the, the modern day UAP soft disclosure conversation. Yep. If we're gonna, if we're going to look back on this and say we already have, which is my opinion as well, black budget, reverse engineered craft, operable platforms that use some sort of exotic propulsion, field propulsion, electrogravitic. Um, what's what do you think the game plan is with this rollout of talking about the UAP issue and and the way it's being addressed in a modern context? Sure, sure. It, you have to look at it in a psychological standpoint. When somebody, it, it, and I, I touched upon this when we spoke previously, when you're waking somebody up from a, a deep sleep or a waking uh, nightmare or sleepwalking, uh, you, you should never just abruptly uh, wake them up because that would cause disruption in, in that person's uh, mental health or, or their reaction uh, will be uncalculated. Uh, that's something to consider. Um, what 
what I believe when I say they, I'm referring to whether corporate or military or whoever is in control of this information and this narrative, that's who I'm determining is they. Um, I think what, what they're interested in is preparing us so that we don't have an uncalculated response. The last thing they want is a response that they weren't prepared for. It's the military. This is what they do. This is exactly, you plan for A, you get ready for B, and then you have C already in the pipeline. You don't want you know, a, a letter down the road that you never planned for. And that's what would happen if you just dropped the ball. You, you don't really know how the mass would react, especially in this day and age. So you slowly, you slowly feed and fold this into the modern mainstream narrative, and you kind of take the temperature of where society is heading with this information. How accepting are they? Uh, do they feel that it's, it's uh, something to be afraid? I think what we're going to see in the future is a uh, situation that gets blamed on a UAP, whether it's an accidental crash, whether it's a nuclear accident. I, I, I truly believe that something is going to get blamed on the phenomenon, and that's going to be used to, to kind of drum up what you're saying. Where's the fear? Well, they haven't gotten ready for the fear. You don't throw fear in immediately before you stoke the fire. Um, if, if you do that, you have chaos, you have mass disruption. If you, if you fold the narrative in, get it, people ready, and then throw the fear, you're not going to have the mass hysteria, mass disruption, uh, mass breakdown that you would if, if, a, if they literally said, you know, here's the whole story. This is fact. Here's an alien. Get on stage. Here's their ship. Uh, that would cause so much can No one can argue that it wouldn't. And, and you have people who say, well, show me the facts. Show me everything. But it's not just about us as individuals. It's about us collectively. Yeah, yeah. And collectively, it would be absolute chaos. And I can tell you that as someone who you know studies the economy and uh, <laughs> follows uh, economic and market trends, it, it would ruin us. It would absolutely ruin us. So they have to get ready for the 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 fear phase. I hope I'm wrong. I hope this is all nonsense. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, this, this is what I do. I connect dots. I analyze trends. And, and this is what I'm seeing happening. Uh, so do you, do you think that the people that have emerged out of the bureaucracy, out of the DIA, DOD, um, do you think they're a part of this? I, you know, because <clears throat> this is a problem with the UFO community is, is, is a lot of people have become quite starstruck and although i support the efforts of people um within congress and the senate and lou elizondo and christopher mellon uh, i'm also not naive about the fact that they come from these backgrounds that normally people, people <laughs> counterintelligence <laughs> yeah i, mean, I, I, I do find it to, yes yeah. i do find it a bit strange that people are very willing to let go of the fact that these people are counterintelligence professionals um, because they're at the moment championing the cause what that we believe. support. Um, yeah, yeah they're, they're, <clears throat> they're supporting something we believe. So, because because I I I do think that this is a very strategic rollout, a very strict, like, and I don't believe that rules were bent to get the videos released. I I'm also a little dubious of um Lou Elizondo resigning out of anger and becoming this you know going to the New York Times it feels to me like all of this has been very meticulously planned so I'm I guess I'm asking you if that's how you feel about these people <clears throat> that have emerged out of the government structure and have become leaders within the UFO movement and the UFO community do you think they're a part of this long plan I don't think you'll ever get the entire picture from any of these individuals. Um, one, they can't tell you everything. And two, they're not going to uh, relay all the information that they know or why they're doing things. You know, when you're creating a long-term plan like this, so if I'm advising a company and we're putting together a 10, 20, 15 year, you know, kind of trajectory uh, plan, you, 
you don't have um, this notion of everything is so strategic down to the year, who's going to be this, what's going to happen this. You have a broad definition. You have a broad outline. Right, right. And you, you have these gradients on this timeline that you kind of try to enact uh, whatever the scenario you want to enact to be strategic. But you look at, you know, five years from now, we'll take a look at the market. We'll take a look at development, technological development. And we're going to do this at that point. But we don't know exactly how we're going to do that then, but we'll figure right. it out. So you, you're saying to... basically there's area of movability, but there's checkpoints yes. in the road. So you can move Correct. around a little bit in this space, but we're going here next and we're going here next. And, and that's Correct. the plan. Yeah. Correct. So, you know, how hard was it to have somebody in a tip? You, you create a small budgeted you know, they, they throw around $20 million. Like it's a lot of money. I no, mean, that's it's laughable. Yeah. It's absolutely Jump laughable. Change. There are, Jump change. There's cars that are more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it, it, uh, so you have a guy who's clearly interested in it. He's very, um, uh, you know, you do a psychological profile on, on Lou and he's very, he seems to be very augmented toward, uh, this heroistic, sort of uh, personality he wants to help society by solving this riddle uh and, and so it to me it's not hard to believe that somebody on the inside who actually had knowledge kind of drummed up his fire got him riled up and you know helped kind of usher him into the direction that they wanted this isn't hard this happens yeah, all yeah. the time in counterintelligence and I believe that he got counterintelligenced right. uh, himself. And, and, you know, he was already on that path uh, and frustrated. And that's easy to see if you're, you know, a higher up and you're a good manager, you can take the temperature of your staff <laughs> and you should be able to tell where they're at headspace wise. So I really think, and then you have people like Chris Mellon, who I think he's just pissed that he wasn't on the inside. And yeah. I think he's honestly, yeah. and I think you see this uh, a lot uh, like Harry Reid. Uh, he, he, he probably had uh, accounts with other individuals who were in the know and he wanted to be in the know because he's Harry Reid. And so damn with it, he'll figure it out. And well, I think that's right. I mean, he he applied for special access program status yeah, for ATIP and got this, denied. You know, the men in in power, like Harry Reid, Admiral Wilson, Chris Mellon, mm. they all have uh, a, an air of authority. They 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 scoff at the idea that they don't have the ability or or you know, reason to, to be read in on these projects. And they know they exist because they're privy to other people who probably yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, that pisses them off. And so they, they, they want to figure it out. And, and so I see, that's how, that's how I see these things playing. It's not, uh, I don't think Lou or Chris or Hal put off or, Tom DeLong or uh, any of these people are in on the plan. I think they they're all being maneuvered. They're just cogs in a wheel. And it's yeah. it sounds it sounds dystopian as hell, but uh, that's my analysis, just based on my knowledge of how these uh, things work and how people interact and how technology moves forward and uh it just seems like there's a hidden hand uh that doesn't have the best interests of uh of global citizens uh, at hand and maybe they do i don't know the whole story it could mm -hmm. be there's really two ways to look at the government's cover up here one there's three actually one they're benefiting from the cover up and so if you're benefiting, you don't want to release it. Two, they don't want to look like complete imbeciles, uh, which I don't ascribe to because there's enough accounts out there that we have this technology. And I, 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 
have had conversations uh, with individuals in, in aerospace off the books and, and casual conversations where I've heard things that uh, corroborate this research and this presentation. And then three, um, the truth might be so disturbing that they just don't want to tell us. So those are the three mm. log those are the three logical conclusions, none of which are appealing to me. I don't want to think that our government is so inept with the massive amounts of money we give them uh, that they can't figure something like this out. I don't want to believe that they know all this stuff and are keeping it for their own benefit. And I also don't want to believe that uh, it's so disturbing that, that they just don't want to share it. So what are we left with? Your guess is as good as mine, Mikai. I mean, I, I, I don't like any of those options either. And I can't really think of a fourth. Um, they really no, do those, think the uh, yeah. primary Maybe option. those are the three orbs, <laughs> the red, white, and yellow. Yeah. Here's, here's your options, folks. <laughs> Which one are you going to pick? Which one are you going to pick? I mean, I hope that we get more clarity as we progress over the years with this. Um, you know, I mean, it's interesting that there's uh, there's these, obviously, I mean, most people that have done any sort of due diligence on this know that the, the US government is not a single body. It's a fraction of different alliances and, you know, vertical pathways and stovepipe programs and not everyone communicates with each other. But it's, it's interesting that there, there definitely seems to be a contingent within well at least the dod and within aspects of the pentagon that, that don't want this happening that, don't, that seem to not want this conversation that's occurring right now that we're saying could be a green lit sanctioned yeah. and relatively strategic uh rollout of information there seems to be groups that don't want that to happen i mean we've recently had the dod set up a a, a, a group name that is so long i can't even remember it and can't be bothered so it's intentional it. That, yeah, that's intentional. The AOIMSG or whatever it is. The yeah, yeah. They, they do it as a joke. I mean, these people, these people do, I say these people again, I'm, I'm referring to the people in the know. You see this with, and this is why I actually reached out to you, Jay. Re remember in the email, I, I saw your interview with was John, Ram John Ramirez. Yeah. R Ramirez. And, and I listened to it and I said, holy shit. This guy has come to the same conclusion I have. Yeah, and, and I've listened to a lot of uh, a lot of analysis on the phenomenon. Uh, I've drawn my own conclusions, but I'm always open to new information. I'm never set in stone about anything. But uh, he approached it similar to how I. You look at it as an analysis, not as a as a researcher per se. He's looking at at the data yep. and, and coming up with, you know, the logical conclusion, not an interpretation of soft data. You're looking, you know, you're, you're analyzing what is known and drawing logical conclusion from that. And despite how incredible the conclusion may be, it's still the most logical conclusion. And so I, I was very impressed with uh, some of his talking points and also some some other reasons. And I had asked you if I could, uh, if you would send my information along. I guess you must have uh, Googled me or something because you uh, reached back to me. I think I sent you another interview I did with Deep Prasad on uh, UAP. And, uh, and then we kind of went from there. Um, I kind of trailed off. Where, where was I going with that? Uh, I'm not sure. You were, you're talking about John Ramirez and his theories. And uh... yes, yes, he he did an excellent uh, job at describing um, what he he knew and what he analyzed and what he witnessed uh, or was privy to, and, and his analysis uh, as someone entrenched in the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Perhaps a, a presentation uh, from someone in, you know, the analysis community, someone who conducts, uh, you know, trend analysis for a living, <laughs> might uh, 
present something interesting for people. I really wanted people to see that this wasn't a series of one-offs. Yeah. This is a long, long history of yeah. accounts. Was, so these things, awesome. these, and, and it's inarguable at this point. Mm -hmm. Anyone who argues against it, I, I've lost, uh, you know, interest in, in people like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Ah, and yeah, yeah. it's disappointing because as a scientist, you should always follow the, the, the logical yeah. conclusion yeah. of analysis. And despite how unbelievable a conclusion is, that is science. Oh, well, you know, uh, Neil said so himself. He's reviewed the UFO literature and he's just not impressed. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not about him being impressed or not. That's a personal perspective. Uh, impression is personal and that's not scientific. Yeah. The, even the terminology is not scientific. Yeah. So I have, uh, I have issues with, with him and that was disappointing. And there's like a number of others who really put their foot in the ground yeah. to the point of foolishness. I mean, it, it, their arguments are silly at this point. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's primarily coming from mainstream academic science and it's coming from yeah. people like SETI, Seth Shostak from the SETI group. You yeah, know, it's, he's it's, backpedaled a little bit. He, have you noticed? Well that? Should, he should have I have an you know what I made a conscious effort to just not really look into what Seth has to say anymore. So perhaps I should have a look at seeing how he's I think Avi Loeb has done a great job oh, in Matt, kind yeah. of shaming shaming them. <laughs> Um, and Avi, if you're listening, thank you. They, they needed that wake up call because if you're representing the scientific community or analysis community in any way, uh, they're not being good stewards of, no. of this profession. They are, you know, posting and presenting their personal impressions and feelings and emotions on something. And, you know, I have my own uh, interpretations, but I don't have any impressions. I yeah, don't, yeah. It, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. It, you know, it's an analysis. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not chiseled in, in no. granite. Well, I, I, you know, I, I've said this a few times is that there's a big difference between a curious skeptic and a professional debunker. You know, one of them is genuinely curious and is going to be objective and the other has a bias and has a point to prove and is going to do everything they can to prove that point. Just like we have that on the flip side with people yeah. who film the sun and say a lens flare is a UFO. You know, there's there's plenty of people on the other side of the aisle who think everything is anomalous and won't accept the answer that it's you know a prosaic explanation but the the professional debunkers have the exact same issue on the polarity side of that argument and they just refuse to acknowledge when something doesn't fit within their acceptable parameters and m many of these cases do not fit into their parameters you know i was i was disappointed with seti and, and seth shostak i think that they I'll have to listen to see how he's changed his opinion because I, I just think that they've backed the wrong conceptual horse with you know fast repeating radio bursts and trying to find things. Oh God, that's and, listen. Uh, I can you know. tell you right now. I'm sorry to interrupt, right. but uh, that is such an antiquated approach. Right. Look, <laughs> we're on the cusp of developing quantum, yeah, uh, entangled uh, communications. We're you know we're not far from that, and trust me. We're not far from that. Yeah. I'm not saying it's here now, but we're but not close. far. But it's close. So, uh, you know, whoever is piloting or whatever is piloting these crafts, they're not going to use radio is slow. Yeah. Radio is, is slower than light. And light is like a snail crawling through the universe you're not going to use that method of communication no. you're no. going to use quantum communication uh that's just and and the fact that seti is wasting their time with this is mm. is, is sad because it's not forward thinking which is what seti is supposed to be exactly if you're exactly. forward thinking you change your perspective as things change yeah. this is the scientific principle like yeah. If, if you're conducting research and new information comes into light, you don't continue the research as it were. You have to then you have to reinvent your research parameters to include the new information. It's a pain in the ass, but you have to do it if you want a viable analysis. And SETI dropped the ball huge. Mm -hmm. I, and I think they got lazy. Um, and, and Seth, like I, 
I, I know they fear uh, credibility. I fear credibility. You, you know, I don't do many talks on this topic. I don't post much on this topic. Um, but I felt like I can finally come forward without it uh, hurting my um, professional credibility at this point in time. Thankfully, I, I've yeah. been interested yeah. in the topic for a long time. So, oh, I wanted to touch upon <clears throat> TTSA real quick. So just as a point of uh, statement, I have never been um, contracted by TTSA. Early on in their development, I had sent them a kind of a, a tactful uh, analysis and um, uh, project idea that would help garner um, more interest in their business and yield uh, higher revenue. And, and basically <laughs> I proposed a very insightful and well thought out uh, project that they could take on that would, that would cost very little. And um, they loved the idea, but they weren't ready for it. And well, that's what they told me. And I thought that was interesting. You know, I, and this is going to sound, this is going to sound arrogant as hell and your listeners will probably think I'm an ass, but I looked at it from a perspective as this is an, an excellent, uh, business strategy. Like there is, I do this for a living and I, and I'm like, you're doing this, but you could do this for little to no cost with an extremely high yield uh, and increase your um, potential. Potential, um, not not just earning, but uh, marketing potential and outreach and everything. And they said they weren't ready for it, and I'm like, okay, that's odd. And then later on, they split up. And so I was like, did they ever really want to be a viable business uh, at all? Uh, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder, and I've had, and I speak with um, a member of the, who's left on the team now, uh, since Lou and Mellon and Hal uh, all left. I think Hal is still listed as a, as a reference, but I doubt he does anything with them because um from what I've heard directly from this team member, uh, they're no longer pursuing the science aspect. They're yeah, pursuing yeah. the arts. Uh, so that I guess the term that the, the actual name of the, the company or organization is slightly misleading. Uh, should just be to the arts. I, I guess I, I'm not sure. I do like uh, Tom's books. I find them interesting. Uh, they're not the best, but they're not terrible. Uh, and I, and I think some, I think he does kind of strategically try to include information that he's garnered uh, over his interviews, whether or not that information is accurate. I mm -hmm. have no idea. Uh, I feel like he got uh, counterintelligenced himself. Uh, that sucks. But, you know, I think we'll all remember TTSA. We have to give credit where credit is due. They were the first people. Mm -hmm. and we Everybody mentions the New York Times, but it was, yeah, TTSA. It was TTSA. It was TTSA. It was TTSA yeah. that first released it. Yeah. And uh, so, you know. No, it's all, you know, I Tom like DeLong. Tom. Yeah, I know. Tom like DeLong Tom. has propelled the, uh, me too. He's propelled this in. I mean, you know, when he was first going on interviews, everyone was calling him crazy. I remember Joe Rogan taking the. I thought Joe's uh, treatment, and I love Joe really, Rogan, yeah. but I'm like, Joe, yeah. what are you doing? And yeah. he never has since apologized no, for it, the way he fact, treated I've, him. I've picked up on a few things from other interviews where they were showing the Nimitz footage. I actually remember. I should, it's a bit of a Yeah, dick. and he made a comment. A yeah, yeah, yeah. Comment. Like, Young yep. Jamie put up the video and it yes, had the I saw that. It had the watermark and you hear Joe, you huh? hear him literally go, yeah, don't, get put that up, don't put that up again. Don't put that up again. And it's yeah. just like, you know, like he's 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 upset that he threw him Something, under the bus yeah. and then suddenly it became very legitimate. He obviously thought, wow, this guy's a clown. He didn't like, he didn't like, and I knew that this, this was a turning point in their interview when Tom DeLong showed the TR3B footage that looked a little bit dubious. Wonky, and, uh, yeah. 
yeah, like Joe was pretty much kind of done at that point by the looks of it. And then, yeah, he obviously was legitimized by the New York Times and Lou Elizondo coming out and Christopher Mellon. And uh, and Joe never really took that back. So, no, I really support Tom. I think Tom for, a, you know, I mean, obviously he's a very savvy businessman as well. But for a Blink-182 rock star to basically be the catalyst for UFO, UAP discussion in Congress yeah. and the Senate, that's a big deal. And uh, it's a shame. It's also not something he's experienced. And so I think yeah. like the community needs to cut him some slack. Absolutely. He's not yeah. he's he's not a researcher or analyst. Yes, he's probably well read versed in the subject matter but he doesn't traditionally come from that background so no. you know he did what he thought he was doing yeah yeah he's done a hell of a lot i think it, and it, it is it is a shame that ttsa didn't become what we all felt it would become and i'm sure tom DeLong feels that way because yeah. I, I don't think he ever th thought this was going to happen to ttsa well i can i can tell you was some degree of certainty that uh, Mellon and, and Lou knew that this would happen. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, um, but not so much Tom. Not so much Tom. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder what Tom's up to now. I, I don't see much. Does he tweet at all or make content? I mean, I, ha I haven't, I haven't really looked at his Twitter that much. He makes the occasional tweet, um, but really he seems to have stepped back from being as public about all of this right now um you know they they kind of promote the merchandise the ttsa merchandise yeah but yeah he's it, it's 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 a far cry from where it, where he was you know a year or two years ago when uh when he was uh full full ahead and full speed on this so i'm I'll sure i'll be curious to see his uh interview in a couple of years when when he reflects on the whole yeah. situation yeah i want to know his take yeah if he felt like he got screwed or played or yeah. if it was completely amicable, um, yeah, he may not. He may not admit it either. So yeah. that's interesting. I do like what Avi Loeb and Michio Kaku. I mean, Michio Kaku has been one of my favorite scientists. Oh, he's been, he's been ahead of the game since yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, so he was he, early in the uh, doors, acknowledging that this should be taken seriously. He's, yeah, he's great, and he's uh, he's just great. He's a great thinker. He's you know. Um, always stayed true to the scientific you know yeah. Yeah. It, it may be incredible or amazing but study it research study it, it. Exactly, think yeah. about it read you know and, and avi Loeb, and there's some other really prominent players who are helping uh the narrative now i don't think avi Loeb fully believes that that object was <clears throat> an alien craft or anything. I think he's just utilizing it to point out to the scientific community that, look, you guys are scientists. Like yeah. you're supposed to investigate yeah. things of interest. And, and I laughed. I literally laughed when I read the article about the proposed explanation of what the object was. It was so convoluted that it was less likely that it was a, you know, some sort of s s hydrogen propelled frozen object that you know didn't emit any gaseous tail it, it was it was absurd Grasping and its uh, powers, basically it it made less sense than it, if it was yeah. an actual craft i was like this is th th this is ridiculous yeah um and i think he's doing a good job to point out that the scientific community has dropped a huge ball uh yeah what i what i can tell you though um not in detail but i can tell you that there are a lot of private entities and even government agencies interested in electrogravitic field generation and lots of money is going into this research uh quietly um not talked about uh, you, you know, a few million here, a couple dozen million there. Uh, that's not much to these big players. And uh, there's an interest. There's a keen interest. And what I think we're observing is that these insiders of these uh, companies and, and uh, bureaucratic institutions and military organizations, they have an idea. They know. 
they know that it's real and they know that other humans have the toys. And I think they're, they're like, I think they're very interested in yeah. trying to develop it. And, and I know firsthand that money is being spent. Yeah. I will go on record saying that I can't say, unfortunately, due to NDAs who and, and where and why and how much, but I can say that money is being spent on this. I know it. Uh, it's interesting and fascinating. On, uh, on, on electrogravitics and yes, electrogravitic yeah. uh, field propulsion and and just generation. It, it's usually not. They don't talk about propulsion. It's usually just field generation because yeah. the propulsion is a, a supplement effect of the field. So. Yeah. But uh, material science is seeing an insurgence uh, uh, with uh, quantum computing right now. So. Uh, you have these quantum computing startups that are doing some amazing things and, and really are able to crunch uh, the data a supercomputer would take you know, yeah. forever to do. And so they're, you know, putting together these ideas of new materials and synthesizing these new uh, molecular structures that were previously unknown and uh, it's only a matter of time before they take that data and uh, make it in in real life so things are changing fast and, and the yes. horizon is is broad yes um we're gonna have to wrap up soon because we're coming we're, we're over three hours now which is uh, oh awesome. really yeah, oh yeah i know man oh, wow. um I'm but sorry. Uh, no don't apologize there's nothing bad about having a good long conversation about these things and this is a kind of subject where you need to have long conversations because there's just so much to discuss but um yeah uh, we'll, and i'm gonna have to get you back on because i'd love to have a talk about just kind of futurist perspectives the the kind of quantum computing and advances in yeah. physics where it might lead us. I'd love to have that conversation, but I, I, I will ask, um, I will ask you real, uh, real quick. Now, do you think that within our lifetimes and perhaps even within a relatively short period of time, there will be some rollout of this type of technology of field propulsion, uh, maybe through the military? Do you think we're going to unveil a platform? depends on what you consider our lifetime are you considering our lifetime as the current expected uh, lifetime or are you considering what our lifetime will be in 50 years from now yeah okay well let's yeah okay so let's say 50, you, 50 years from now 50 years from now uh i think that um we will be well in our way into uh, fusion drives. In fact, we'll have very large uh, fusion reactors and working toward um, making them smaller. Uh, for the first time recently, I just read the scientific paper actually two days ago. On, um, they first time ever, they got more energy than they had to put into a, a fusion reactor. Right. I don't know if you read that. No, I didn't so read that. that that, it, that represents a tremendous leap forward because now the principle is there. Uh, we've proven the point and now it's working on efficiency. Efficiency is increased through material science and further tweaking um, the components, mm. which is inevitable given any rate of increase over time. So we'll see, you know, nuclear fusion reactors will will be getting smaller in about 50 years we'll already have it uh agi will be in place that'll be running uh, large sectors of the economy uh market uh, the global markets will be run on an agi artificial general intelligence um i think a lot of the bureaucratic processes will be run uh, uh, by an agi so we'll have uh, increased efficiencies better materials to further those efficiencies, uh, fusion energy. This sounds incredible, but it's, you know, this is the trajectory. Anyone, anyone who wants to argue this, uh, I feel free. I will publicly argue it with you. Uh, these things are inevitable. They're coming down the line. Warp uh, and electrogravitic field propulsion 
in my opinion, has been around for decades. Not publicly, um, but I believe we're on the cusp. DARPA just released the new scientific uh, about that. Yeah, yeah. literature on the uh, the discovery of a warp field uh, bubble, which is nonsense because uh, we've known about that. Even civil scientists have known about that for a while. So, well, wasn't it that they actually? Uh, I, I believe the claim is they actually made one, like a tiny, tiny yes. bubble in space and time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I wasn't as impressed as I should have been. I know that sounds bizarre. It's just that I feel like that's been around for yeah. a while, and DARPA is just kind of squishing it out of their butt cheeks yeah. into a <laughs> shell company. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Like, no, no. When I, when when it said that they had accidentally created one, I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. You know, and and, and if you further look into who accidentally created it. Uh, the 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 physicist or engineer or the head doctor white yeah sunny sunny white or something like that the, dr yeah. white one of his partnered uh companies uh has been working on uh material that uh is proposed to be utilized in uh in uap so you have this this uh material that that interacts with x-rays at certain frequencies and generates a field. It's in their research. I, I, I went into Icarus or Isaris, or I can't remember. And you look in their research publications and they've been working on material science for a long time that uh, correlates a lot with UAP research. So I find it very odd that this company would be partnered with Dr. White and his team yeah. to accidentally yeah, create yeah. A, a warp field. Well, um, Eric Davis recently came out saying this guy's full of shit. He, uh, he, he, he recently, I saw it on Twitter. Someone had capped a message because he's in a private Facebook group. Um, and he was uh, mouthing off about Dr. White saying, I know who Dr. White is. He's a, is questionable, blah, blah, blah. There's no way that they'd have been able to do this. So uh, according to Dr. Eric Davis, he believes... Well, he's a, he, he's a legitimate researcher. Yeah. If, you, if, you're the, if you're DARPA or, you know, this goes below DARPA. This is subterranean level mm. here. If you're, if you're getting a technology out, you're going to find somebody who's not as credible, who's not going to question this mm. gift that you're giving them for their research and career and professional status uh you're gonna take that nugget expand upon it research it a bit and then proclaim it's yours because mm -hmm. you were told to do that because you're a part of darpa mm, and you, yeah yeah you know you do what you're told so you know eric davis is probably a little butthurt that he didn't he wasn't gifted that uh because he's been known to to talk and not play by the rules so you don't play by the rules you don't get the the nuggets and i yeah. think that's where hal put off and eric davis exist in that line in between uh where they're certainly capable and they know that stuff exists but they aren't allowed into the 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 game yeah they're chasing the golden ticket they've been trying to get yeah. get there for a while i i agree with that um i think that's probably uh probably the correct way to look at it with with Eric Davis and, and Hal put off because they yeah like you said they obviously know their stuff but uh have have spoken out and probably aren't trusted <laughs> to uh, yeah they're, to they're not trusted they they've you know aligned themselves to people who yeah. are uh, controllable yeah um I get we, God, see I, I want to keep going but we we need to wrap up I'm, I'm, one one last thing because keep, yeah. you know you, you were yeah. talking about um Obviously, if they do have this warp drive um, or warp bubble technology, and it's it's already it's already there, it's already present, it's already operable. I guess that's what I was asking about. Do you think that they'll roll out some form of platform? Because when you're talking about a 50 year projection of technological uh, readiness and where we're going to be at that point, it feels like you were talking about we're just going to be building from scratch from where we are right now 
Uh, so do you feel like yeah. they're never going it, to it, let this stuff no. out? They're just going to let us develop it ourselves no. and not. They, talk they about won't. It. They won't ever do it as a platform uh, of their making. What yeah. they'll do is they'll do exactly. It, this is a great example of this the warp uh, bubble mm. research. Um, that's exactly what they'll just do. Drip it out. Keep, drip, drip, drip. It's what Colonel Corso did strategically to develop those key technologies that he stated back in you yeah. know, the eight seventies, eighties, sixties. I can't remember, but that's what you do. This, this isn't new. This is what the, the this is what intelligence does. Yeah. You, you control the dissemination of information. If you have information, but you don't want people to know it comes from you and you need it to come from a source who would have such information, you find the right yeah. company, you find the right team, the right professional, and you say, you're taking this or you gift them that or you they somehow accidentally discover it. And uh, you do that over the course of a few decades. And all of a sudden it looks like, oh, cool, privatization. Look what it developed. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, it's been militarized uh, forever. And they're just bubbling it out because they don't want ties with it. They don't want the public yeah. knowing that's how yeah. taxes are spent. Yeah, you see, if that if that's the case, it, it kind of enrages me, man. You just think about, you know, they're just sitting there on this treasure trove of world changing yes. technologies. Yes, they are. And yeah, and they're just going, hey, little, here's a little breadcrumb, here's a tiny little bit, you know, just ease it out. What over can time. they do? Well, what can they do? I know. I mean, obviously, disrupt the whole global system. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, what would happen? I mean, I'm with you. I want it now. I, I want yeah, it now. I want. Yeah. I want validation, but uh, at the cause of complete and utter disruption, I don't think so. It's never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's never. No, it will. It, it will. Yeah. We're moving toward that direction. Mm. I mean, at some point, uh, especially with the advancements in, in AI they're not going to be able to uh, slow or stop this trajectory. So this trajectory, this momentum is, is, is already started. This uh, schedule, if you will, a very informer, informal schedule, I don't think it's done by dates. I think it's done by phases. Right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we're moving forward. Uh, to what? I, I have no idea. What do we do as a civilization with warp field technology? Do, is there a mass exodus of Earth that people just say, fuck it, and I'm leaving? Uh, who knows? Like, what would happen? We're not, we're not. Uh, see, this is the catch 22 for me, because I feel like we absolutely need a paradigm shift to get out of this kind of slum that we're in with propulsion at the moment and how it's uh, you know ruining the planet fossil fuels we need to get out of that but at the same time we're so immature you'll, you'll have to give up freedoms well that's control. it i mean you know like yeah how do you manage a, a disruptive technology like uh, electrogravitics warp drive and all of this you know how do you manage that um, slowly whittle down freedoms yeah. at scales that seem uh incoherent and un Un, you know connected and you know minuscule but over time every second ticks every sand grain falls and over time that control becomes tighter and tighter at which point you can safely release information of any scale or magnitude without fear of catastrophic uh, um, issues God, none, of, none of this sounds very fun <laughs> no and i think that i think people who have come to the same sort of analysis I have, it's quite disparaging. Yeah. It, it uh, it's disheartening. But what can you do? This is our reality. You do the best you can. You live your life. You be the best version of yourself, and you know, enjoy what you're experiencing because this is our experience. And you know, we there is tremendous corruption. There's tremendous evil. There's lots of lies and deceit. <clears throat> But that's just the reality. We can't change that. And no, no matter how much protesting you did, it would only collapse the entire uh, everything. And then we'd be just nomadic and chaotic and anarchic. And that's not good either. Um, 
this is the ultimate trend of humanity and people don't realize that. So I do this, you know, I, I spend a great deal of time watching the trends of human passage uh, throughout history and time. And there's never been a civilization that uh, still exists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how do you save that um, from occurring? Well, with ultimate control, with tools of control, but controlling in a manner that you wish to create harmony. And it sounds dystopian as hell because it is. But what do you do? Because the advancement of technology uh, precipitates danger mm. flat out. So if technology is going to increase, which it will, given any degree of time, it, it will increase. There's no way to put the genie in the bottle. Uh, so how do we save humanity um, from destroying the planet or themselves? Because technology, as it increases, becomes exponentially more effective at changing or disrupting scales, patterns of scales. So as we increase, it becomes each person individually has the power to change and alter the world at, at larger and larger scales to the point where it's, it's very dangerous. So we're moving toward a, a future of control and uh, I don't like it, but there's really no other there's no other option that I can I can see as long as we're right. technologically unless, unless the, progressing. Uh, unless the phenomenon just decides we're just going to reveal ourselves to all of you at once, because you know, in one in one way, the, the cards really are stacked. You know, stacked in their favor. They whatever this thing is, it could reveal itself on mass to everyone and and make it completely undeniable and disrupt the entire world. So I mean, there's always that potential. Yeah. That, Maybe there's yeah. some looming event coming towards us that we're currently ignorant of, but um, maybe, maybe that's what happened to previous civilizations. Yeah, maybe they, <clears throat> you know, advanced too far, or the aliens, uh, you know, we'll call them aliens. I, I don't know what else to call them. Uh, phenomena, mm. uh, you know, were too casual in in their uh, showing of themselves and mm. disrupted civilization. Maybe yeah. that happened several times. Maybe it didn't at all. I don't know. I yeah. enjoy <clears throat> the topic and I really love talking to you. I know you need to go and <laughs> we will talk again next time. We can talk about uh, where trends are going and, and my analysis on, on AI and quantum computing. I, I would I would really like to talk about that with you. So I will get you back on after Christmas, I think, because um, that's that's an area that I'm interested in. Uh, I'm, I'm no way near close to being a, an expert or a professional in that field, but it's 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 just the op passive observations of where we're going, technological trends, trends in AI, quantum computing. Like we're definitely going down that route. So would love to do that. This has been awesome, Mikai. I mean, you did a fantastic presentation. We've had a oh, really thanks. good chat afterwards. I hope I didn't put anyone to sleep. <laughs> no, I don't think you would have, mate. I mean, there's always going to be one or two people that go, <laughs> but that's just the way hey, it is, you I, know. I, you know, you yeah. need you need noise, otherwise it doesn't uh, it doesn't look credible. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I I wouldn't worry about that. I think people will really appreciate what you've uh, what you've you know done for us today with this presentation and it's just been a good chat as well so I'd, I'd, I'd love to get you back on but uh until then just would like to say thank you very much because it's been very thank enlightening you. and it's been very interesting i love what you're doing jay and keep on keeping on i think you have solidified a, a, a spot in the community that will only continue to strengthen and i i really appreciate what you're doing and thank you for having me on i That's look great. forward to talking again very kind of you, and uh, we will definitely do that very soon.